just a warm welcome to everyone joining the call today. My name is Belinda Flaherty. I'm the school registrar. Um, you were supposed to be at this very moment meeting Mark Morris, who's our head of teaching and learning. Um, unfortunately, Mark has been held up with our external examiners who are attending today for our diploma programme. Um, but he sends his very best wishes and uh, will try and join um, the events during the course of the afternoon when, whenever uh, he gets some time away from that examination schedule. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words to, to get things started and to welcome everyone here and then hand you over to um, my dear friend and colleague, Michael Weinstock, who will um, take you through uh, the rest of the afternoon. Um, I think uh, for all of us here in the call who have uh, been with the AA for a while, and I know we have new people joining us, but I think the month of June um, is always uh, an interesting month for the AA. We're completely exhausted by the time this month comes to an end. Um, it's a very intensive month of assessments and assessment activities, welcoming external examiners. Um, but the most important thing that we do um, in the month of June is celebrate our students and um, especially celebrate the exemplary work uh, of our students, those projects that have been completed over the course of this academic year. Um, and we come together. We never require any excuse for a celebration at the AA, um, but it is a very special moment to come together as we did last Friday for our diploma students and today for the students uh, representing nine of our uh, postgraduate programmes um, to look and share and discuss the work that they've been undertaking um, over the year. Um, most of all, I would like to welcome those of you who are applicants to these programs and who are joining us today, I think, to see the very best example of what we are and, um, and to see the very best example um, of what we hope is, is the moment in which you, you make that final commitment and, and come and join us because um, we would be so honoured and um, it would be our great pleasure uh, to welcome you um, to these courses and programmes um, so that you can commence the projects that we hope in 12 months time we will be looking at um, at this event again in their exemplary form. Um, there are a lot of students, but as I say, from nine programmes. Um, and today, after uh, I hand over to Mike, you will also be hosted by uh, Will Orr and Elena Pascolo of our postgraduate provision, um, who will help with um, coordinating discussions around what, around what you see. Um, the discussions are an important element uh, of what brings us all together and, and unites us, um, these discussions around the work uh, that we see. Um, but most of all, before I hand off, I just want to thank the students who are presenting, um, soon to be graduates uh, and soon to, to carry those awards out into um, the world. And um, there's no better way to, to represent the AA with all that you've achieved. Um, we are really excited to see the culmination of your work. Um, I'm sure it'll be mentioned today, and we're probably not going to labour on it, but in AA fashion, we'll probably talk about this academic year for the rest of our lives. It's been a year like no other. Um, and I think that the majority of people that you will meet today presenting their projects, um, whilst we've all faced challenges, the biggest challenge of all for many has been the transition from um, physical a physical reality at the Bedford Square premises um, and at Hook Park to transitioning online and to um, that global family that we talk about at the AA actually really becoming the global family um, this time. Um, teaching was delivered uh, across all con continents um, and absolutely every time zone imaginable. But um, I do applaud the students for what they have achieved. And, um, and thank you um, to those students who, pre who present today for being part of the AA world. And thank you for showing us um, what that has meant to you as articulated in these projects. So I'm going to hand over to Mike now um, and please enjoy the day and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Well, thank you, Belinda. Um, it's great to be here and great to be seeing you, even though you're 
tiny little heads from my screen. Uh, and for many of you, I do remember you being a lot more than just a tiny head. Uh, so uh, for many of the students who are presenting today, they will have spent some time in school, uh, but they're kind of, um, when they were working on their thesis and dissertations, um, they would have been at home, uh, either with their parents or in some other accommodation, not always very ideal. We've discovered a lot this year, um, and not all of it bad. It's been, I won't labor the difficulties because we've all had them, uh, and me included, and, and times when we have felt uh, despair and isolation. Um, but we've also discovered how to work together spread across different time zones. So I'm sort of aware that um, it's just after 12 here, but it's six in the morning in Bangkok, um, sorry, six in the evening in Bangkok and six in the morning in New York. Um, in Sydney, it's 10 o'clock uh, in the evening. Um, and uh, in, in Rio, it's nine in the morning. We've got used to and found ways of working um, within these different time zones. And I think particularly uh, students who've had to develop a kind of resilience to uh, a new circumstance, one that they didn't plan on and one that their tutors certainly didn't plan on. Uh, we, we've all found ways to continue our projects, to continue the development of our discourse of intellectual life. Uh, and in a way, that's what I regard as I'm full of admiration for, for the students and their accomplishments uh, in doing that. I do think, uh, and you will have heard lots of lectures and no doubt there are many more to come uh, about what a terrible year it was. Uh, but I do think we should look also at the positive things that, that despite the circumstances in every program, there's been really good and sometimes great work achieved. And that we've been able to pursue uh, the development of our skills and knowledge. Uh, we've been able to talk uh, about new architectural ideas and new ideas about culture and our, uh, our presence in it as architects and, and what we can do about the future world. And I think I'm full of hope for this generation of students of the, what their impact will be uh, in, in architecture. Um, so that's, that's all the kind of more lectury side of things. Um, what we're going to do today is we, we've got um, a list of uh, presentations and Will, uh, Will Orr, who, who was uh, teaches with us, but was also a student until quite recently, and Eleanor, who teaches with us, uh, are going to moderate the conversation. So after each presentation, we'll have a short conversation about the ideas and the techniques or the uh, innovations and the potential impact of those ideas uh, in, in the future world. And finally, I want, want to say, despite everything, for me, I've stayed at the A for 40 years uh, since I was in first year. Um, and what's kept me here has been the advancement of, of ideas. I haven't always had the quickest route to developing new skills or knowledge myself, but I've loved being amongst people uh, who do that and who prompt me to, to look more closely and develop my own work. And, and I think that's the spirit of the AA, that we have our differences and we're interested in different takes uh, and different parts of the landscape uh, to situate ourselves in. But what we share is, is the faith that the ideas that we conjure up and the work that we do uh, is going to contribute to the future and the betterment of the world. <laughs> that, that's uh, probably quite enough for me, I think. So I'm going to pass on to, to Will, I think, as the next person to speak. But I'm really looking forward to seeing your work today and to discussing it with you. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, so yeah, my name is Will Orr. I studied in the AA postgraduate program, graduating with, from the PhD in 2019. I spend most of my time now teaching in the undergraduate history and theory studies program, but I've also had the opportunity to regularly join the history and critical thinking program over the years, keeping in touch with one corner of what's going on in the postgraduate program uh, at the AA. 
so together with Elena Pascolo uh, of Housing and Urbanism, I'll be hosting this afternoon. And with the help of Raj Singh and Ben Ibbotson behind the scenes, everything should run pretty smoothly, I hope. Uh, very excited to help bring these exemplary projects to, to you all today and to have a chance to discuss them. So I'll just quickly, again, reiterate the structure. We're, I guess, now about 15 minutes ahead of time, uh, but we're aiming for 15 minute presentations for each program. I'll briefly introduce uh, each program and then hand off to the program head who can introduce the exemplary project. And then uh, Ellen and I will chair a brief Q and A for around five minutes. There should be a brief break between each program um, but we'll try to get through everyone in time to have around an hour of discussion around all the programs as a whole. Um, uh, I should also say uh, we are recording. So if you prefer not to speak on camera or to speak at all, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat and we'll be monitoring the chat and we can read out your questions, but please do uh, speak and join us uh, on video too, if you, are willing. Okay, so the first uh, program is the AA Interprofessional Studio. The AA Interprofessional Studio, or AAIS, explores alternative methods of collaboration between multiple creative professions through research, design, and production of a series of genre-defying spatial performances and constructions Participants examine the ways in which creative work and design overlap in the cultivation of unique project events. So I'll hand it over to Theo to introduce the exemplary project. Thanks. Hello, um, I'm Theo Lawrence. I'm the director of the Interprofessional Studio. Um, today we will uh, see from Kachim Tsang the project, uh, which took place um, in China. So. Um, we have the possibility of uh, using the international work uh, net we have uh, with all the different students uh, being able to perform and do their final MFA project in the country they're in. Um, many of them were in London, but some as well were in their uh, respective countries. So uh, Keqing's project is actually um, a Master of Fine Arts project. We have a Master of Arts and Master of Fine Arts project, but the uh, a Master of Fine Arts will always be applied projects. And I think her uh, project is a very good example of how you actually build your own professional networks where you can start off from um, so that your project is actually already a, the project which is part of your own career rather than just a group project from within the course. So in her case, uh, this network was already so successful that they were selected just now to a very big uh, Biennale in, in China, um, which is taking place, I believe, already this week. Um, and I think she will say something to that as well. But this project was the one introducing her to that uh, Biennale as well. So I, with no further ado, I hand over to Keqing and showing a wonderful project, which really shows how networks can be built via creative projects. Okay. Well, thanks. thanks for your introduction, Theo. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, my project uh, is uh, uh, like uh, it's more about an interprofessional environmental theater uh, about a story that you find uh, where you are, uh, a best place uh, between where you are and uh, uh, where you want to arrive. So, I'd like to start my presentation from a short video of my work. And then I'll uh, describe uh, some details about uh, uh, how I achieved that, the process. If there are anything wrong, please tell me also the sound. Uh, 
and we're not hearing anything. Uh, okay, I'll share again. I also found that. Thank you. 
So this is just one version of my final result. And another one would be uh, is the a one shot video that uh, uh, has more details. And I'm gonna show, show the pics and the words to tell the details. So this uh, this work is named uh, down here. So it's a live performance that takes place in a tea house in one of the oldest districts of Chongqing, China. So this area is uh, really um, has uh, many old uh, things, power plant and uh, railways. It has many uh, memories left left here. So what I do is to use the the um, the old place with uh, many uh, aerials inside to combine with my creation. And uh, so, as uh, Teo just said, uh, our um, well, our AIS is an interprofessional studio that uh, collaborates with many. Um, different other projects of uh, the, the, the projects. So we usually have the uh, a process of creation from research by ourselves and then to design uh, what we need in narrative and space and also choreography and costume. Then we uh, also in the process, we are going to find our collaborators to create the piece together to make it professional. So you can see here is uh, four stages in my project, the main stages. And uh, we uh, actually sometimes I find uh, our project is uh, except uh, the uh, creation part is more like uh, in a role of film producer that you need to consider um, many parts of the, uh, doing the process from concept to collaborate and uh, even the budget to the final event. And you need to consider uh, specifically about the time and what you need to do in uh, the period. Uh, so this project uh, research part, I started from um, some ideas that uh, reserved in my mind and my body for a long time and also it's because I find that the place as I like to discover uh, more about the memory and uh, the relationship between memory and the, and the space. So and also you know uh, our project has one year to um, to hold uh, events with uh, classmates. And there is two projects, uh, uh, two team projects uh, that we held before. The, the, mm, the thing of them also uh, have a huge influence on my own MFA project. And here is the uh, also, my site is uh, uh, choosed in my BA project. So that's kind of, uh, uh, I think it's uh, not only a thing in the one and a half year project, it's about your long years in professional development. And come to the design part. 
uh, in this project, I started with narrative route because I um, choose the site at the first. Uh, uh, so I designed a lot of things uh, just uh, according to the space. Designed uh, uh, how performers gonna move and uh, the installations in in the space. So here, uh, the installations in each part, uh, well, it's um, has a strong um, connection with the narrative to help uh, the performer move stage by stage. Like in the first table, here is uh, uh, teacups and uh, a cheese, on, uh, no, cheese is on the second table and first uh, there, the performer gonna use this to be a server. And on the second, uh, they become a visitor and a customer in on the site. Here is a transition. Um, in this stage, it's a transition part for them to, uh, well, to go through to the next table, next stage of creation. So here is a um, uh, bring up of memory in the space. And on the third table, we tried many materials to um, match the process of uh, creation. And finally, we decided to use the clay, which can form a lot of uh, things to uh, imitate like the God created the world. And also the clay can be used in uh, another stage in the next step. So as a continuation, the digital content is also part of my uh, research. Okay. Uh, what I interested in doing the uh, one and a half year, I'd like to explore some mm, the software that can interact with people, the interact with the dancers to create some effect. So finally, I create like this in in the door. Uh, that's uh, like like a, another digital world being built by the performer outside. And also there has many layers you can uh, read by yourself. It's a, a process of uh, entering, entering the world and uh, building sculpture, sculpture uh, herself in the inner world. And then uh, to um, have the process of uh, uh, develop, uh, she will be in um, distribution after um, a, a process of sculpture and then become a messy um, memory points. So that's the content of the projection, um, which can also be a individual individual work in this environmental theater. And then come to the uh, third stage collaboration. I find uh, several friends to collaborate. Uh, first is uh, the choreographer who is also a um, dancer that uh, uh, AIIS has a, a long collaboration with, who is learned in Trinity Labong. And 
which is really perfect. And then in the uh, sound part, I invited a friend to create the whole background music and uh, also the live performs music uh, for it. And then we also need to adjust uh, some details um, for the final piece, the one shot and the edited piece for the videos. This part, I also feel um, the sound is a, a really huge part that can influence the whole performance and also and even lead the performance for the dancers. So uh, here is how the final uh, final route for performers to go through the whole space. And uh, we also need to consider the costume but in this part, uh, in this project, I just used uh, a simple white and black. Also, and uh, for me, the big, the big, uh, like uh, the really big part is uh, videography, because uh, for many projects, I think uh, how you document it is, is also um way that describe how you think of the project it, it need really matches with each other so the live performance and the final video can um and present uh, the best effect so come to the final stage the real, real event the final event we also need to do publication beforehand. So the, here is the, some poster and the GIF that uh, we do the publication. And the teasers. And then uh, come to the live e performance on site. Um, performers ready for the event, and there are also cameras, speakers, audience, audience arrangement, and then confirmed uh, this, the field notes need to be confirmed uh, advanced. Uh, that's mainly about to control the lighting to change the uh, site the specific uh, uh, stage effect. So it's like uh, in daily and on stage, the different thing uh, are, because uh, we use a place that is uh, serving in the daily. So we can, we, there is a lot of collab uh, also collaboration with the space, the, um, the tea house need a uh, lot of communication with them. So come to the live performance. And I divided the, the whole performance into 10 things and uh, with the different roles on two performers. So the first is um, entering with no identity, entering the space. And the same to uh, she come to the first table to be a server to do some uh, daily daily id daily things to serve the customer, and then come to the third, uh, second table. They uh, she meet the another performer who as a frequenter here to chasing and uh, having the tea. And then it's a transition of the awakening that uh, they bring up, bring up the memories. So you also can see 
uh, the dropping water and when to interact with the materials on the tables. Here is the uh, um, main part. You need to find uh, uh, some specific materials that suit for your ideas. And compute the scene five uh, is on the star table creating to in, use the clay to interact with uh, uh, like um, one of them uh, is modeling another one and lighting the, the memory with because uh, uh, different materials can lead to different uh, um, trees on the table with the, the fabric. And come to the scene six, it's uh, inspiring. Like uh, inside the small room, it's, uh, it's an, another artwork. That's the fashion uh, just uh, in inspired them and attracting them to the inner small world. And then there come to the scene seven sculpturing, the two performers showing different reaction to, towards the scene inside the small rooms. Why still repeating what they what she do, what she did in before, and another one and continue to exploring. So it's the process of interact with the, um, the motion tracking projection. And then she find suddenly find uh, the next room with the monitor that you can see. Uh, after she she's in the world uh, collapsed uh, from the projection, and uh, so it's like a higher level of a world with the uh, with the collapsing. The another performer come down, become a, a row of uh, bonding. So they are uh, is filtering by the black performer. It's the, like the past, uh, the white ones struggling in the past. So come to the uh, final scene, it's uh, renovating, renovating and uh, it's struggling out from the past and come to the outside world. But also it's uh, another unconfirmed world. So for the AI project and, and also for the, the this, my MFA project. There is a lot of development I can have in the future. And one is the audience participation, which is being used in many of our events. And it's a trade that in the um, environment of theater also, uh, the, some uh, formal stage performers. And then I use this to uh, apply for a theater festival in China. And I attended it um, just uh, several days before. That's really opened my professional uh, professional process, professional road. So I also will continuation of the collaboration with my, uh, my other collaborators. 
So that's all of my projects. Thank you. Thanks for my tutors in the whole one and a half years. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kashin. Thank you. Um, so we've got a few minutes. Well, I think we're actually, yeah. yeah, we might have to be a bit uh, tougher <laughs> on the timing from now on, but we are back on schedule at least. Um, so we've got around five minutes for questions about this project. And then again, at the end, around four, we'll come back and talk about all the projects together. But are there any questions right now uh, for Kesha? Mike? Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. It was re really good to see that. Um, I, I was struck by, as you were at the end, when you walk out into the street, the, the figure in black is left on the floor inside the, the venue or inside the artwork. Could you talk a little bit about that, of what's left, uh, be you left behind while sh you are making for freedom and the outside world? So your point is about the black one left being left inside. Well, for me, that's more about uh, the past. And uh, uh, like uh, when you go towards a new world, something need to be keep on that stage so you can move forward. <laughs> you need to leave something behind in order to go forward, is that? Yeah. I'm struck by by that because it's and that figure is also uh, a figure in black that you struggle with all, all the time uh, through through the performance. So when, you, but it initially was the victor in in the chess game, I think. Um, so there's a kind of evocation of the past. In I mean, I I really like the ambiguity that the. The projects, you know, being cited in the tea room is, 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 you know, that's a kind of cultural memory tea rooms that are dying out or becoming uh, tourist attractions. Um, and that memory, the meaning of memory has changed. The things themselves don't change, but uh, how they're interpreted and their, their kind of cultural presence changes. So somehow I think in your narrative that that the figure in black is going to, if you re-perform this or take it to other venues, uh, that's going to be a, a kind of strong feature that other people will, will respond to. Um, yeah, we, there's always some regret in leaving something behind. But, but maybe if we're too much imprisoned in the past, we, we don't have a clear uh, entrance to the future. But, uh, I, I enjoyed that part of the work very much. Thank you, Michael. I, I wanted to just, um, at this point, just thank you and for Theo for a wonderful way to start the conversations we're going to have uh, this afternoon. Because I think what you've gifted us is this moment in which we need to pause and recognize that, in fact, we're all interprofessionals now because we need to be given the conditions we've lived through, the conditions we will be living through. And what you've gifted us with, I think, is an insight in terms of how we move from down here to out there uh, in a sense of how we might start to structure these alliances that you talk about in all, and how we take care in detailing those, in bringing in um, other voices, other um, other disciplines, other um, other ways of seeing and doing what we call projects, and indeed where they might lead us to. So I think for me, this becomes almost an emblematic figure that we take forward in our conversations today when we assess, you know, what the afterlife, what the postscript of your investigations, of your research are as students and indeed as programs, the research we undertake together collaboratively. 
and where it might lead us. And I think this is the important thing is that, as you say, you know, it's, um, it's opened up other, other roads for you. And I think all of these projects that we'll be seeing this afternoon will open up other roads, not only for you as individuals, but I, I think and I hope also for us as a school and for programs as well, in terms of how we start to build alliances across different methodologies, different insights, different ways of being careful and, and working and curating together. So that's what I'm sort of taking forward in terms of these two figures and this environment, this kind of, um, this framing that you've offered us. So thanks again for that. Thanks for your feedback. Maybe I just am missing some parts due to the internet thing. Anyway, thank you. Great. So. Uh, we've got about five minutes to turn over to the DRL. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Will, Mike, and uh, Elena for giving us a platform to share uh, some of the work uh, that we've been developing over the year. Um, my name is Theodore Sparopoulos. Uh, I have the pleasure of directing the program. Uh, called the Design Research Lab. And the, the framework in which we engage in educationally is, is really a team and design research oriented. So in, in method and in practice, we have a kind of self-organizing methodology of students coming from all over the world, working together collaboratively on larger kind of thematic umbrella agendas that we work on for a period of about three to four years. Uh, what we initiated last year was a, a research subject that we were titled uh, Social Ecologies, and in a sense, trying to challenge the kinds of ways that we work on kind of larger kind of human uh, challenges that we find in the world. And in particular, the project that we're going to be looking at uh, was responding to something that I titled Disaster Complexity. It was part of an agenda that was trying to uh, see beyond building uh, issues around architecture and infrastructure and how we can uh, develop kind of uh, larger kind of ways of thinking about semi-autonomous or autonomous systems for a kind of deployable architecture. So some of the themes were around health and well-being, augmented the, augmenting the NHS system. Others were dealing with migratory issues and uh, notions around housing and migration. Uh, this particular project uh, from Angelina, Conrad, Kyungya, and Gida uh, was a project titled Radical Gravity, and it was looking at systems of distribution that could be deployed as kind of semi-autonomous or autonomous uh, architectures in response to disasters. Could be earthquake, uh, could be other humanitarian crises, but it was looking at, at a system that would work as a kind of open framework to somehow instigate a kind of critical response. Um, I'm joined today with uh, Alex, who is also our coordinator in the program, and the students, and I'll pass this over uh, to the students to be able to share their thesis uh, that they developed over 16 months. So thanks everyone for giving us the chance. And just for anybody that's in London, the project is at the moment on show at the London Design Biennial. So that's all for me. Hello. Um, is everyone here, Jonathan Conrad? Yeah, I'm here. Yes. All right, um, let me share the screen then. Um, do you see everything? Do you see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, we are Radical Gravity Project team. We are going to present our design research thesis. Every year, natural disasters kill around 90,000 people and affect close to 160 million people worldwide. They have an immediate impact on human lives and often result in the destruction of many buildings and basic community infrastructures, including bridges, roads, railways, and transmission towers. Natural disasters cause mass displacement. 31 and a half million people are losing their homes after natural disasters every year. This number escalated in recent decades due to climate change and more people living in vulnerable and exposed areas. Mass homelessness after natural disasters is a global problem and therefore requires a global approach to it. There is almost no country in the world that stays unaffected. 
However, the solutions to this global problem tend to be local, leaving people in danger from the countries that are unable to respond. They use land infrastructure that is often compromised after natural disasters. The available solutions for shelters are either quick to deploy, but not durable, or the ones that can provide any longer term accommodation, face transportation and assembly issues require a professional workforce that is out of reach. The shelters tend to be fixed and finite, although the process of recovery is evolving and population needs and numbers are changing. Many of the settlements end up being standardized ghettos, which is not only depressive, it's dangerous for people that just went through trauma. The settlements are dependent on existing infrastructure for basic operation and many times are abandoned after use. Um, we are aiming to address those problems working on a global system that, however, corresponds to the location. Using air-based infrastructure that stays relatively unaffected after a disaster event, we are looking into controlling air dropping as a deployment method. Using the falling stage as a self-building stage, we attempt to deliver ready-to-use shelter settlements to people. Once on the ground, we believe that shelters need to have the embedded flexibility to deal with uncertainty and change. Through having an adaptive and generative system, we are aiming to produce diverse spaces for human well-being. We think that self-sustainability is an important part of the disaster relief architecture, providing people with at least their basic needs. And after the city's, city's recovery, the shelters can still play an important role in its ecosystem. Um, here are the key features of our project. and the overall timeline of the system. Free deployment. Our over control system strategy is combination of centralized and decentralized approaches. Prior to deployment, it's important to alleviate highly choreographed process of dropping. Our approach is global, but we believe our settlement should respond to the local context and the environment. Our system on four different scenarios with different types of natural disasters, different locations, geographies, numbers of people affected. After receiving the input data about the disaster, the system calculates the number of units and airplanes needed, analyzes the location, simulates the disaster possible spread, and decide where is the safest zone. chooses the landing place and create an abstract plan of the settlement according to all these parameters, deciding which units and body plans we use for further stage. Before starting our project, we conducted a research on civil habitation control system. Based on that, we started to design our strategy to calculate the dropping point and over flight optimized by using wind data. Dividing the wind into three categories, um, helper on the way to target, obstacle on the other direction, and in between neither of those, we constructed a framework to test the calculation of the overflight part. We started to simulate the navigation strategy by introducing cost field map. So the unit tried to follow the helper wind, avoid the obstacle wind, and with the third type, calculate their movement, adding wind compensation. Acquiring data from open sources from different altitudes, the direction and the strengths of wind. We are able to calculate the approximate deployment point to minimize the need for maneuvering in real time. Deployment. The part that starts from air dropping is divided by phases that are connected with altitude. We calculated how many units we can fit in the big cargo airplane and designed super packs. In a radius of three kilometers of target area, the airplane releases them around 23,000 feet. Then while they are still tightly packed, and quite mobile, we started to think how to achieve different choreographies through simple local rule sets based on rotation and small displacement. So in a stage that comes after dropping, 
our units start to form specific body plans optimized for flight and corresponded to the initial calculation based on side parameters with the wind force as a push force for rotation. The stage happens in between 15,000 to 12,000 feet. Even after the calculation of the approximate flight path capacity to maneuver, because wind can change in real time. Yeah, can you hear me? I am reading my guys. No. Okay. Uh, due to the fact that we incline towards a more probabilistic model, optimizing the cost of shelters for mass deployment, uh, we started to look into more passive strategies of control. We have discovered that the way the object meets fluid or air resistance can be actually the way to control its flight. Uh, so we started to work with fluid dynamics to understand the relationship between form and air resistance or drag. Mm -hmm. um, then we realized that collective maneuvering will allow us to produce even simpler units. So we looked into how the form of the individual can manipulate the overall aerodynamic form. Uh, and that was this one. So how air viscosity or internal turbulence will lead with the use of air pockets influence drag. Uh, during our exploration, we discovered that different weight distribution affects the flight and its directionality as well. Uh, then we decided to confirm this assumption by conducting a series of physical experiments attaching uh, different weights to the surface in different ways and observe this behavior. Uh, the assumption proved to be right. And by introducing the surface porosity along the weight distribution, we observed how it affects uh, both time of flight and its displacement. We tested the angle of attack strategy. The way the form meets the fluid is interrelated with how much rotation and drag is produced. After our free for research, we realized that we built a certain intuition and we can start designing our units. The first prototype was based on maple seed logic. Our next prototype was very different and was based on partial logic, but we started to look into using contracting airflow for space creation when autorotation was a deceleration strategy. The third prototype we designed combined more mechanical control with partial logic. In option A, the control was happening by controlling the shape of the partial, similar way as in par fours. In option B, it controls directionality in aggregation level by opening and closing the disk or the inflation inside. We also realized that the surface area necessary for proper amount of drag has to be much bigger than it's needed for architectural purposes. That's how we came to the logic of multi-layering. We examined this logic um, while also while dropping. The experiment showed us that the inner part has to be very optimized for the flow of the air to ensure the proper amount of drag. Based on these tests, we came up with fourth and fifth last prototype that has this multi-layers logic that is combined with architecture need for diverse spaces. By controlling the flow inside of cellular spaces, we can distribute drag, the force that is opposite of weight, but can be easier to be achieved during the free fall. Our design path was very, very non-linear, but the latest prototype ended up having the most optimal level of control for our purposes and takes more advantage of dropping for actual space formation comparing to previous ones. So between 12,000 feet and approximately 5,000, our units have the maneuvering stage, where the main goal is to reach the desired location. It happens by drag distribution in lead pods. But we believe our units should travel in smaller aggregations that we call body plans. This will allow us uh, to achieve greater control having simpler entities. In other words, some units can remain completely passive, optimizing the energy cost. We started to simulate what kind of body plants is the most optimized for the flight, having different breaking thresholds in different wind conditions. And same, but uh, with more active wind zones. We constructed pretty accurate simulation framework to try the logic of drug distribution on completely different body plant shapes. 
and we ended up with the most optimized for maneuvering body plants. After many trials uh, with different drug distribution, which is purple dots, uh, they are actuated living pots or source of additional drug. We came up with overall strategies for different types of wind. With helper wind in the same direction as desired destination, the actuated living pots pattern uh, create a certain curvature that interacts with the wind, reaching the dis destination faster. With obstacle wind, uh, we found the distribution that is on the contrary, minimizes it and has the minimum push. Within between wind, we were able to produce a rotation behavior to the target. We also simulated how different connections affect the flight. Sorry. There is lots of work. So, um, yeah, um, the, we made a catalog how different drug distribution can achieve different behaviors in our main, main body plant types being in the same wind condition. All these tests we decided to reinforce with physical experiments. We started by having open holes only in two living pots and it was relatively stable with minimal openings. Then we tried a simple non-symmetrical drug distribution and it proved to work. We actually saw the displacement. Uh, the third test happened with a relatively strong wind and all holes opened um, and the result was stable landing and beautiful flight that uh, people around enjoyed. Before landing the body plants aggregate according to all calculated parameters. The simulation shows how they attach through controlling the distribution of drag. They take decisions with whom to aggregate from the visual sensing and lasers for more precision. We tested some of the algorithms in rows that can be used for this purpose. So using a Kinect-like sensor, units aggregate around 5,000 feet. We tested an unsupervised learning algorithm for land cover classification, distinguishing which locations are safe to land and analyzing the ground. Based on these parameters and GPS data, units make decision to land. We conducted a series of aerodynamic tests around stab stability while landing and the impact force. Apart from technical execution of landing, we approach this stage as the one that actually results in space. We started to test a simple setup how the different weight patterns would result in architecture formation. Here we introduced vertical force as well, which can be interpreted as drag. So closer to the ground between 4,000 to 1,000 feet, the units land after sensing the suitable location, locking the air inside of leaving pots and releasing anchors. Anchors take the impact force, saving the materials and also secure the settlement on land. The way the inflation or freezing the form happens is by chemical reaction between citric acid, baking powder and water. The pots that were actuated because of maneuvering reasons direct the architecture morphology on land. Here are the technical details that enable the unit to orient, interact, sense the environment, translate gravitational potential energy to electric, use chemical inflation as a securing inflation state strategy, wind inflation as forming and maneuvering strategy, components for attaching to other units, and landing. In case something goes wrong, such as more function of specific units, wind change or difficulty with landing in target location, the units should have inner protocols how to deal with 
these situations in the best possible way in this show. Land operation. Uh, the location where units have landed can differ from the one calculated by the system. So the units should bear a certain adaptation capacity. He tested how the agents pack and adjust themselves according to the given environment. A pathfinder algorithm generates arteries between pre-calculated nodes and adjusts the existing network in its fittest form. After 990 consecutive iterations, now it's possible to observe a different number of units being aligned. Uh, the way they just skip that one. Okay, the way the body plans land also could be different from the calculated one to our more passive control strategy. So the units self-model and calculate the additional living pod actuation depending on number of neighbors, proximity to an artery, and its programmatic scale. From this topology of connections, the system is capable of constructing a network of points. It will be become a foundation of the circulation network. The resulting distance is used as a function of fitness in an evolutionary algorithm that would try to optimize this length. Uh, different types of natural disasters may require different types of programs, but overall we designed our settlement to have housing with water retention units or where people actually live, agriculture and hospitals in cases where we have higher number of wounded people. The program is distributed using evolutionary computing, being able to densify housing areas to the maximum, but keeping the circulation network according to the boundary conditions of each living pod. Uh, illustrating it in an example of a settlement of 11,000 people, which means 5,850 families, on the left are the pods actuated by dropping, and on the right, additionally inflated ones with water harvesting units are calculated. The small pods on, uh, okay, it's fine. The circulation plan and possible programmatic division of the example of another settlement for housing, the system calculates a variety of co-living spaces for different sizes of families. Pod density distribution is customized according to the environmental parameters, such as landed state, program, terrain, climate, or circulation. This, the self-sufficiency of the settlement is something we consider is very important, especially after a natural disaster. We started to speculate how rainwater flow can be guided by manipulating the outer layer surface. Different pods have different connections to the outer layer. The ones that are in the middle are connected through arches, which are air beams that structurally hold the roof and can be directly guided to the surface above. The pods in the corner have absolutely no influence on the surface and can be moved to other places and join others. Uh, this is an example showing how by changing the size of pods, we can alter the uh, outer layer surface. The settlement example showing how all these parameters guide the space. Uh, the choice to create minimal cellular spaces, having sheds for gathering is also based on our research of uh, psychological states of people after natural disasters. Most of them need to be around people where they spend most of their time. Uh, however, a certain privacy is also required even if the space is uh, minimal. And population and shelter settlements is not a constant. As a result, uh, flexibility is essential for these settlements to be able to adapt over time. We understand that we need to address the need to adapt that can be achieved through changing the size of the living pots. We started to try more passive strategies of stitching as a way to control the inflation. We also examine stitching as the way to guide the surface. Then we came up with the idea that by combination of different materials with different rigidity and elasticity level, we can control the scale by only changing the inflation rate. Here are the catalogs of different elasticity patterns and resultant deformation after inflation. Combination of different materiality allowed all the aspects of the architecture to correspond to the physical requirements of adaptation. Mm -hmm. 
So we tried to introduce this logic of different materials combination to our living pot design. Yeah. Yes. Could you go next? Uh, combining rigid material with elastic, we are able to transform a deflated column into the biggest living pot where the ratio of space over material is in its maximum. The elasticity level can be also related to the transparency of materials, private, opaque, or windows transparent. Inflation rate number and the locations of actuated living pots can produce diverse spatial typology. By attaching different scale of units, the settlement offer families to have from transitional adaptation to long-term population changes, adjusting relationship of cellular pots. The internal logic of the pot is based on the codification of inflation degree, adapting to the human behavior, giving different scales of pots. The, these show the detailed components of the pot and living pots with different scales, which are small, medium, and large. All these changes in living pots affect the change of the surface. The water collection can be global for shared kitchens use and local for drinking. The curvature differs according to this different shape. We also consider using fog catching nets to, the, uh, to get the drinking water in dry areas. Climate control is another strategy for self-sufficiency we look into. Because the source of our additional inflation is endothermic chemical reaction, which means absorbs heat from the atmosphere, we, can, uh, we are getting sort of decentralized passive air conditioning system. For cold climate, the heat can be distributed from the shared kitchens that are placed strategically. Um, dealing with such complex issues such as disaster relief, architecture requires a holistic approach to the design, specifically thinking about the life cycle or a process rather than an object. Thank you. Thanks for attention. Thanks very much. Okay, we've got uh, a few minutes for questions before handing over to Projective Cities. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand so that we can see a notification because we're not gonna be able to see the actual video of all the people in the attendance. I have, a, I have a quick question. I'm, I'm really interested in the, the way in which the aggregation of the units factors into your thinking at each stage, even beginning with aerodynamics. Um, so if I understand correctly, there's a, uh, there's a unit called a body plan, which is made up of smaller pods. And that was your original experimentation around aerodynamics. And then there's a larger aggregation of body plans. Could you say a bit more about how you think about the connection of these at each scale, there's aggregation of units? Um, I think like the, mm, so we have the unit, which is uh, still quite a large entities because it has living pots inside. Um, well, uh, yeah, we explain why, why is that uh, for dynamic reasons and architectural purposes. So both combined and uh, Yes, we have kind of body plants, which is uh, like larger, like if it's like small aggregations, right? And, and bigger one. And basically everything depends on the wind because uh, we are dealing with air, which is uh, yeah, well, quite a complex environment to be in. And, um, um, and we are like looking more towards like passive strategies, which means a certain level of control, but uh, um, well, yeah, like, but not that certain as, let's say, aerial vehicles. So we were trying to find uh, something in between and, I know, make it as flexible as possible and using, like, as, as less energy as possible and, uh, um, yeah, but achieving, you know, a certain level of uh, 
yeah, like of control or uh, architectural and aerodynamical qualities as, as, as needed. I think, look, I'm going to hop in there unless anyone else has uh, something to add, just because I'm trying to really stick to time here. Um, again, you know, thank you for an extensive and uh, really um, immersive um, amount of work that you've undertaken this year, obviously under extreme conditions, as, as Mike mentioned uh, before. I think, again, without um, talking about the specifics of this uh, Kind of incredible spawning structure and infrastructure that you've devised, which obviously has references back to Buckminster's Dome, which we kept kind of seeing flashbacks of, which I thought was quite <laughs> interesting throughout the presentation. I'm intrigued to know, you know, where else, where you take this next. Again, I'm thinking always of the afterlife of these projects, um, because obviously you've started to form your own um, research agenda, yeah, which is, which is been taken seriously both within the school and obviously now beyond the school. So I'm, I'm interested to sort of understand whether as a group, as a collective, um, uh, alongside your colleagues in DRL, um, whether you've started to understand what else you might model from the ground up almost now, you've kind of understood parameters of air and the criteria around those parameters within your model. And if we take it back to Kexen's contribution about um, alliances and collaborations, uh, it would be really intriguing to understand you know, how you stress test this model you've, um, you know, you've devised and who else would need to be involved in this conversation to materialize this, to mobilize this, to implement this, to really see what changes it, um, um, it requires at an institutional level, at an, inter an international governance level for it to be materialized, not to make it real, but in a sense, in a way to, um, place this um, and to displace your assumptions about this thing we call a model. I think that, you know, what's really revealing about all of these endeavors is um, they're not static. They really are dynamic in terms of where they drive discussion within our field and beyond the field. And I think that's when I think they become really instrumental models which shift paradigms of what we thought is possible and indeed where it might track to next. So I'd be really in intrigued to, to see what else we see coming from you, you know, in a few months time down the line, who, who you build alliance with and where this thing um, goes from the ground up. Yeah. I mean, I mean it literally and metaphorically as well, once it lands. Sorry, my questions well, are kind of always ending on rhetorical <laughs> statements. It's a kind of stylistic trope. I, I do apologize for that in advance. <laughs> Well, I mean, if I can answer maybe a portion of that question, like uh, after some point, we, we, we actually speculated on these uh, units being able to be the part of the recovery process that these things are actually being uh, used in areas where we see these natural disasters at some point. Uh, because, uh, I mean, the location or like how would actually, who would actually fund these or even have the uh, right to actually throw this out of an airplane is a I think a good question at the end of the day, but still, uh, even if we manage to somehow have these settlements on land, and I think they will be an uh, important landmark for the city, and they could e even be potentially be new uh, points for them to be actually rebuilt again. I think they could be recycled in a way that um, not, I don't mean something li literal recycling in terms of materials, but as an idea and as a space, I think that. Uh, has its own effect. Plus, the infrastructure tends to have its own sustainable resources, such as plain drinking water, which really can be used at all times for multiple uh, programmatic uh, possibilities. I would put it that way. I mean, I think just to to maybe respond to Elena, I think the challenge is, is one kind of acknowledging that these are architectural problems that the uh, architecture community and the discipline uh, are not really very much engaged with. And we see these humanitarian crises pretty much on a daily basis, but uh, to try to give kind of agency to design research to be able to kind of address some of these problems. Uh, if we look at architects who've been working on these kind of problems, people like Shiguru Ban come to mind, uh, but their dependency is very much on people 
at the local level, basically instrumentalizing, mobilizing, and being able to respond by creating their own shelters. So I think part of the argument and the thesis uh, as a community of these students working together is to look at kind of models that potentially can be uh, deployed without kind of so much human labor on site uh, to be able to respond to things that are ever changing and using models potentially that we see deployed from AI and machine learning strategies and Amazon warehouses and things that are much more strategically organized uh, where a lot of the research in the lab is looking at control systems to help manage this. I think the issues of looking at textiles and design projects is also, I think, a challenge to the community to move beyond representation and to think about problems that are more prototypical. I think in that way, I think the, the urgency is for people to mobilize around this by communicating their engaged kind of participation in some of these subjects. And then I think we may open ourselves up as a as a conduit to basically find ways to work on some of these challenges. So I think the, the issue that I would suggest for the students is to see themselves as part of a larger kind of collective, not necessarily like in the tradition of the AA that they brand themselves into an office and live vicariously off of a project for their career, but really about looking at the kinds of problems that they really want to actively engage in and to try to find models or frameworks that their knowledge and spatial kind of ways of dealing with simulation and design can actually actively participate. So I think these are challenges that we all face and in the lab, we're trying to really actively engage that as a way to also challenge ourselves. But I think the question is really a spot on and I think the students have to see it beyond job. And uh, I think that that's something that we would want all of our students graduating from the postgrad. Uh, to see where they can actually see themselves and sort of challenge existing practices. Thanks very much, Theo, for, for that summary at the end. Uh, I think there are a lot of themes here. I mean, there's a huge number of questions to pick up on just with these with this project alone. Hopefully at the end, we'll, we'll continue this discussion. Um, in the interest of time, I'll pass directly to Platon to introduce the next program. Great. Can you hear me? Right. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Um, lovely to see you after so many, many months. Uh, congratulations to all the students that are graduating in this incredibly complicated and demanding year. I mean, it was really a, a really, really demanding period for all of us. Um, I don't want to say much about the program. Um, Projective Cities is uh, an MPhil um, in architecture and urban design. Uh, it's 18 months uh, long um, and it is structured with like two distinct phases. One, which is uh, the phase one, the first year, which is more about teaching sp uh, specific modules, design, studio, seminar, and academic writing, while the second year is devoted to a individual dissertation project. Um, the project that you will see from Darian is precisely that, a thesis project that he developed in his second um, year of his studies. Darian, the floor is yours. Thanks, Platon. Give me one second to set this up. Can you see a white screen? No. No? Can you see what's going on? Yeah. No, yes, okay. yes. Great. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Darian Knoblauch, and today I want to present to you my dissertation, Kristall, the domestication of water. Kristall uses water as its vehicle to interrogate abject forms of urbanism, to uncover the techno human assemblage that structures our territories urban environments, homes, and bodies. It investigates into the emergence of the bathroom within the global north as a built repercussion of body culture through a series of case studies which reveal its spatial and social implications in search of new living models today. I will present this work via two mediums. First, through the thesis book, through which I will flicker as a work in progress document, and secondly, through its architecture. I will use the book format of the dissertation in order to give an insight into my methodology, aims and objectives, and further on through a series of case studies which form a grand narrative 
that synthesized the research before I conclude this presentation by introducing you into Crystal 4, one out of four designs which I will explain in depth to portray how architecture is used in order to synthesize the research into a product of design. Methodology. The thesis is structured by three acts, productive narcissism, seduction machines, and intimate aliens. Each act is structured through four subdivisions in which nine architectural case studies trace the domestication of water through a specific lens, while each act concludes through a design proposition deriving from the evidence that it has gathered. Introduction. The domestication of water is an emblematic product of modernity and reveals quantum leaps forward in engineering and mass production manifested in the repressed and seclusive power structures that are inscribed into space. Productive narcissism, seduction machines, and intimate aliens set the stage for three explicit research paths that relate water through a reading of self-design, infrastructure, and domestic living models to the restroom by pairing contemporary readings of pop cultural media with archival conduct of historic case studies. For today, I will take one out of four case studies from each chapter in order to introduce you into the theoretical framework. Chapter one, productive narcissism portrays the bathroom as a stage through which the human body constructs and further on fetishizes the civic self and declares the bathroom of the global north as a liminal space which only finds its importance through the sign values of its objects that it is adjacent with. It crosses Baudrillard's system of objects and translocates this reading to the morning routine of Patrick Bateman within the movie American Psycho in which characters are described through the objects that they own. From here, Baudrillard's sign value is further used to interrogate into the spatial repercussion of the bourgeoisie figure and is further on explored by putting into question what the modern narcissist could consist of when finding its reflection within the mirror image or a pool of water, more precisely by understanding water as an object of the self. The perroquier, which left off into the Seine in Paris the first time in 1761, allowed the bourgeoisie to get privately into contact with water in order to wash off their bodies. By heating it in the kettle before it was detached, filled with bodily liquids back into the river. The circulation pattern of the bathing boat is organized according to sex by two landings, A and B, through which the user could enter the male or female part of the bathing boat. The chapter further continues by giving resolution to the architectures of bodily shame through a parallel reading of the invention of the bathing suit and its document water yards, rendering the naked body as an obscenity. This was later undermined by Victorian bathing etiquette, such as the bathing machines of the 18th century, understood as a unit, and its genital urbanism, which started to structure the coastline of Borkum. The chapter finds its conclusion by reflecting on the boat, the docklands, and the bathing machine, three infrastructures which mediated the soft human body through architecture and its wider territory by using Berlin and Brandenburg as a stage to introduce four distinct architectural types. Crystal one and two are part of a network of architectures, which is placed around the orbitable highway that connects Berlin to its wider territory, Brandenburg, and uses their appearance as last islands of communal restroom culture in service of its 350,000 daily commuters through a car wash and a highway shower for truckers in search of a more reciprocal relationship. The reciprocal relationship sits between the outside and the inside through performative infrastructures aiming for transparency which connects the interior with its underlying matrix. Act two, seduction machines. The second act further expands the domestication of water by questioning the way in which society constructed water into good and bad nature. Moreover, good and bad water accelerated the gender distinction in relation to its use. We can find as portrayed to the left side, man which drained the Brandenburg wetlands, built dams or hydro infrastructures, dressed as Friedrich the Great and tamed so-called wild bad nature outside of the house, while the then purified mastered socio-natural product of domesticated water enters into the household. Here, the gender related domestic labor of maintaining the house became a part of the woman. Act two therefore questions the lack of visibility of hydro infrastructures today, which mediate between the wild and the tamed, the supposedly natural and the supposedly domestic, and is in search for hybrid monuments which break this binary distinction. Architectural machines. The first public bath within Germany launched in Hamburg in the year 1855 at the Schweinemarkt, an old workers' district. The circular bathing facility found its protocols of gender-related circulation through its cardinal directions. Women entered through the south, men entered through the north. 
Only the women bath allowed to navigate towards the center of the circular type, which had devices for child care, manual laundry washing machines, and 28 bathtubs. The male section was distinguished in class one tubs out of steel and class two tubs out of iron. Moreover, the building itself used evaporating states of water from liquid to steam in order to use its metabolism for cleansing purposes. The two following subchapters explore the domestication of water through the arts and define the bathroom as a conceptual product of exhibitions. Moreover, the historic case studies support this domestication through an ever continuing mass production process of sanitary devices, such as Dr. Lassa's Volkspause introduced at the 1882 hygiene exhibition in Berlin. Moving forward into sanitary fetishism and Adolf Loos's obsessions in regard of the new emerging figure of the plumber and the fabrication of four body prosthetics, the tap, the tub, the shower and the toilet, which started to enter the German household, but had no functional room such as the bathroom to be adjacent to. Towards Crystal Three, a eulogy to the water treatment plant. Recapturing the core question of the mediation between the natural and the domestic, the second design Crystal Three declares the water treatment plant as a failed opportunity to give due emphasis to domestic architectures and their machining hinterlands in order to deconstruct its artificial metabolism. Public water, Crystal Three. Crystal Three is a water treatment plant placed in the Oderbruch region. Its performative and open structures contrast the military surveillance mechanisms through which these structures are normally secured. While the plant exposes its cleansing procedures on the ground floor, its upper level is only accessible for one person, the Hausmeister, meaning the janitor. The janitor's chamber is attached to the treatment plant and further accelerates the relation between nature and self-defined culture. Spatially manifested by carving the slab into four rocks digged out of desertificated agricultural land. The janitor's chamber becomes a canvas for new modes of spatial occupation. Last but not least, act number three, Intimate Strangers. The final champ chapter introduces the reader into the slow emergence of the functional plan, which 95% of all Germans occupy today. The prior four prosthetics, tab, tub, shower, toilet, started to enter the Berlin courtyard type household before being confined by a functional dictate. The wet room allowed to change function over time due to the placement of light objects, but forecasted the penetration of the bathroom into the private realm. Progressing from the bathroom of the German Empire to the Third Reich, the Reichsbau Typus, which derived from Neufahrt's and Speer's housing strategy for Berlin, casted not only the project of standardized architectures, but furthermore aimed to standardize the bodies which were using these spaces in first place. Domesticating desires. Before going one time into the depth of one of the designs, the last case study is the bathroom of the GDR. The WBS70 Plattenbau type is predicative for the genealogy. It shows a completely internalized bath, no windows for ventilation, hidden ducts, vents, and access points, and ultimately forced machines to take over all these functions and created its well-tempered environment, from the isolation to its ventilation to its contained body, while all machines are censored behind walls and underground. A eulogy to hedonism, Crystal Four. Crystal Four is the last architectural proposition which I will take into more depth. The building is placed next to the Spree in Berlin. It neglects any form of site specificity deriving from its architectural representation, but is dependent from its direct natural conditions, such as the river water and its cardinal directions, in which the spatial layout plays out at its best with an east-west orientation. This laptop con is constructed by a seven times seven column grid, which cantilevers two meters towards the facade. The program is divided into three spatial figures and resembles an urban hybrid for dense city structures. Flow one to three host a public bath before entering a convoluted mixture of plan one, which offers 40 square meter apartments and plan two, which offers 20 square meter cells and a communal kitchen and living room at its head. The building reverse engineers the question of censorship and architectural neglect in which the visitor of the bath enters the building through the boiler room while residents can reach the upper levels via staircases and elevators. The entrance is placed as an open lobby in which gatherings can take place among the machines that serve the bath and the residential levels. The spatial configuration is used to intensify the dramaturgy of rituals from arrival to undressing to locking up one's clothes until stopping in an intermediate space in which bathing slippers can be found to the sides while its center offers a drinking fountain. 
The politics of the interior resolve from a belief that architecture's only goal is to challenge perceptions of comfort and destroy frameworks that constitute normative, habitual relations between occupant and spatial provision. Building and occupant enter into a reciprocal performative relation. Double-sized glazed bricks are used to desensor the idea of a wall, pipes, ducts, and air vents are manifested as spatial elements. Progressing further, four baths are programmed behind each other, which result from the Japanese Saito culture in which the body is cleansed individually before entering shared waters. The water track towards the east can be interlocked throughout all four spaces. Towards the head of the building, the rectangular domestication of water is counterfigured by the organic shapes that result from a tiled flooring out of which these ponds are sledged hammered. The facade allows to be opened up completely within the summer period while encapsulating its climate during the winter time. It does not serve any further programmatic means within this part, and it's meant to accelerate and rejuvenate time in relation to occupation. Looking at an extract of the section reveals how the dramaticity that is searched for on horizontal surface is further defined in its verticality. Material conditions drawn out in scale one to five give information on finishes, structure, and ducting. To increase light conditions, a double glazed brick, brick flooring is spanned vertically between two IPD beams. Normative gaze patterns are reversed. Within the finished zona, smoke and vapor mediate literal control of visibility between individual nakedness and collective gathering. The dwelling units expose the ducting to the outside walls. The glazed brick separation walls are supported by a 120 high concrete slab. We're now looking at an extract of floor plan one in which the 20 square meter apartments are placed. On the residential floors, the outer facade of the building is meant to resemble a porosity that is not exclusive to one's skin. Water taps can be found adjacent to the moldings of the facade. These moldings allow gray water, which comes from the gutter, to be used throughout the building. The, apartment, the apartments are part of a thermodynamic system in which floor heating is activated due to occupation of the bath and uses its waste heat residue in order to temper certain parts of the dwellings. The heat within these zones is conceived by PVC curtains, while all furnishings and objects stand on wheels and therefore allow a multi-flexible layout of different constellations. The circulation spaces are framed by vertical access points, which offer communal infrastructures. Floor plan two of the residential type counterposes the slab type with an open plan in its center. To the head of the building, the communal arrival point hosts along the red. Rather than censoring kitchen, bathroom, living room, and bedroom through walls, four plateaus on different heights mark zones that can be occupied in multiple ways throughout time due to light objects. Two fresh water pipes accelerate the spatial flexibility, not by screwing a tap into a wall, but by extending a pipe via a water hose, which can serve its function where needed into the room. The spatial manifestation enforces constant renegotiation between spatial needs and temporal desire. Intimacy, currently shrunken to the last body parts not seen inside of a Zoom call, is offered back to the occupant as the highest good of our times. The occupant decides what to see and what not. Four aluminum pipes form a continuous sculpture interconnecting all rooms. There is no outside and there is no inside. Space and body dissolve. Thank you. And thank you to uh, Fatin Ezias and Hamid Khosravi for the guidance over the last 20 months. And the rest, I saw it. I saw Hamid at one point popping in. <laughs> What's up, hello. Anyway, uh, I will stop sharing my screen now. Wonderful. Thanks, Tarian. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Mike. Um, a comment, really, rather than a question, because it's, uh, I think, a very intelligent and very erudite pre presentation of uh, uh, a complex work that's been developed over a considerable time. So um, I'm, I'm struck by um, the representation of the, the last crystal four, the last part. Um, it's extremely, uh, should we say, laconic in, in its architectural description in drawings and very erudite in the textual exegesis. So I wondered, um, 
about that relationship. That this is an architecture that, in the one sense, can be read in the lineage of uh, strict architectural representation, uh, and in the other sense, it occupies a kind of textual exegesis of relations of body, culture, uh, privacy, uh, and gender. Um, there's a kind of separation in a way that's paradoxical and very, very intriguing uh, between those two, two, how you bring those two um, modes of architectural thinking together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, if I can react to this, I think the idea of going for such a strict division between, on the one hand side, drawing architectural details and on the, on the other hand side, trying to create a representation that tries to trigger more emotional points, I guess, of the one who's looking at it, really steamed actually out of a lack that I had within my research. Because within the research part, I mostly worked with water as an architectural element. How does it shape space? Um, and at a certain point, I confronted myself with the fact that, of course, on all scales of water, where you can start planetary and end microscopically, like there is this moment where water enters your body. And I could basically go into the liver of a person and show that if I would like to. But rather than doing that, I thought going on a one to five detail of the architectural building, I actually show what materials let your skin wrinkle, so to say. And that should then be confronted with an image in, uh, imagery that uh, tries to, to tries to give that um, tries to give more emphasis to to that bodily experience, I guess. Yes, I think there's there's what I was driving at, perhaps not very uh, successfully. Is there's you use uh, I think you use the phrase the word counterpoint or, or uh, you use a series of counterpoints both in the in in uh, within the text and within the architectural description but in a sense i wonder if to what extent those two two means of kind of conjuring uh, meaning and presence are counterpoint to each other or, or mm -hmm. whether different expressions are the same thing mm -hmm. okay understood i'm Thank not you. sure i have an answer for that or whether it's even a, a meaningful question um but, but uh, it, it's a very impressive uh, presentation, both in, in you, drawing terms and in uh, erudition and how articulate you are about it. I guess I wanted to um, kind of invite uh, Hamad and, um, and Platon into the conversation, because I think that, you know, Darian, what this project for me does is open up a conversation within projective cities as a program. And I think that for me is why is, of course, adding on to what Mike was saying, that's what's kind of exemplary about it as a method of engagement and um, of, I guess, establishing other domains, dimensions, layers, whatever kind of um, uh, words we want to use to really push the so-called limits of our assumptions about um, what we call fundamentals. Um, so I think that for me, you know, the project then becomes quite provocative, albeit poetic, and it sort of opens up potential new avenues, new dimensions of conversations about, you know, the formation of subjects, of subjectivities mm -hmm. through um, the so-called basics yeah, of domesticity. And so I thought, you know, whether those are the sorts of conversations you were engaging with through your project, if not then, then now, and how it's informed a potential future direction, albeit maybe not explicit, but implicit within Projective Cities as a program. Platon, Ahmed, that's for you. <laughs> yeah. Um... For us, there was something really interesting in, in, in Darian's work that has also pushed the program towards uh, some new grounds. And this is the relationship with, let's say, a, a structural uh, research, uh, architectural, theoretical, in writing, uh, uh, meeting um, elements that come from popular culture, that come from, uh, I mean, things that we were already doing, but I think Darian's, Darian's work made it very, very explicit. So, you know, you bring a, you know, um, 
the cover of a, of a, of a, of a techno album next to an architectural drawing and you try to make sense of it. And, you know, you start thinking about the spaces that you occupy yourself as a subject through, you know, your experience with certain elements. And then, you know, you try to convey this with multiple media. And I think for us, this work is really, you know, uh, important because it somehow systematizes things that uh, they were here with us, but um, Darian managed to uh, celebrate and to push uh, even further. I don't know if I'm answering your question. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, I also thought the combination of techniques and approaches was really interesting, especially around this question of the uh, of the subject and the different registers at which the subject is produced. I think we should move on to the next uh, program, but perhaps, and coincidentally, apropos the previous presentation, perhaps we should take a short comfort break. Um, so let's say uh, five minutes to, uh, we'll be back with housing and urbanism. Thanks.
Hello, welcome back. We'll just give a few more minutes, I suppose. Maybe one more minute. Make sure everyone has returned. I just want to double check that everyone uh, attending uh, is aware that they can ask, put their questions in the chat. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, or raise a hand through the reaction, and we'll we'll see you. Um, want to make sure that uh, our nice and large audience is able to participate. We will again have a have a longer period of discussion from around 4.15 to 5 at the end. OK, well, shall we start? Uh, Lawrence, can I hand to you and you'll introduce the program and the example? Sure. Yeah, th thanks very much, Will and Elena. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm joined here by my co-director, George Fiore, and uh, along with Ellen Pascalo, whom you've already met, uh, also Dominic Papa and Anna Shapiro are here with us, uh, my colleagues in housing and urbanism. But I, I also wanted to welcome uh, what is, a, I'm noticing a fairly large community of housing and urbanism uh, people from around the world, former students, current students, uh, but also some of our incoming students. I've noticed Anandita and Eduardo are here and Ville and Bama and Daria, so uh, welcome. <clears throat> um, now we've, we've um, the, the Housing and Urbanism program takes the point of view that uh, urbanism is really about the, the application of a project towards the transformation of an urban area where you're harnessing what are the current drivers of change? And of course, this is a very broad way of looking at urbanism, but it's always focused on the question of the, the artifact that is really driving change. It's, it's focusing on the question of the way in which design helps one reason or develop judgment about uh, next steps within the city, the modification of cities. And uh, what we decided to do uh, with this event is to take something that already turns a, a project which uh, that takes a year and a half to develop into a 15 minute presentation. We decided to make it even more perverse and ask four people to share their uh, projects uh, in this time. Now we've got two different degree programs, an MA and an MARC. Uh, and uh, all of these, um, uh, all of the students are going to present, there are four of them today. Uh, all of them are using design and using design reasoning to investigate the way in which a project might nurture the transformation of an urban area. And so at the, we'll, we'll start with Tao Wang and Jing Yi Xu, who are both MRC students, and then we'll shift to, uh, to Yu Zhou and Caro Gillardi, and we're distributed around the world. Uh, Caro and, and Tao are working for practices here in London, and uh, Yu Zhou and Jing Yi have returned to China. But we're, we're going to do this in such a way that I hope you will see uh, the, the kinds of conversations we have within the program. And you'll notice that two of the projects involve using design reasoning about exemplary projects from the past towards an attitude of new build and reorganization, fundamental reorganization of, of, of the urban fabric. Well, two others uh, take the point of view that what really needs to be investigated is adaptation, so modification of the city through the adaptation of existing structures, uh, existing buildings, existing frameworks. So I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to Tao Wang first, and uh, then the others will follow after Tao. So Tao, over to you. Thank you, Larry. Let's share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I'm Tao from, from MARC, uh, House and, uh, and um, because of the, the kind of time, time limitation, 
I really talk about kind of abstract of what I got uh, of a 100 pages uh, booklet. So um, a major inspiration for the idea of the garden is Barbican Estate and its um, formal experiment in the 19, sorry, 1960s. By imposing a podium system, a, a Barbican, a, 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 so, sorry, um, it sort of uh, really finds the, the, the site as a thick in the ground that carries multi layered circulation. On the other hand, it, it, it generates a dialogue of regularity and, and it, 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 a sort of dialogue in between the courtyard and the, and, uh, and the surroundings. So the thesis, a garden and city carries this formal and compositional approach to the investigation of urban development around the central um, Finsbury Park area. As one of the future district subcenters, the area has tremendous transportation capacity and a great natural landscape network. However, such great resources does not uh, lead to a true civic life around the park and Finsbury central area. The diagnosis of the po uh, problem, problem leads to two directions of investigation. One is the integration of the infrastructure, topography, and activity-driven outdoor spaces. And the, and the other is a kind of new kind of a domestic, a domesticity that is contrary to the introvert uh, terrace housing typology that, uh, that kind of popular in the London suburb. So the comprehension of this new, new, new housing typology entails studies across all the scales from the concept of a uh, household, um, a um, unit, a block, and the entire, entire uh, 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 district and the dynamic con context. So, so the, these are the diagrams uh, to locate the boundary of the investigation and, and urban sections and review the relationship in between the ground, uh, the landscape and out outdoor activities, and podium of public facilities uh, and, and building above. And so, so perspective studies to, to review how the ground of a, a partial of the park really is fragmented and, and becomes the focus of new new places that uh, sit above the kind of interconnected podium system. And then a study of housing exemplars, sort of Alto and Sana and Dinner and Dinner, um, really zoom into the kind of the scale of, of interior plans to a threshold and units and, and, and fully understand the kind of uh, um, in between the topology and morphology, orientation, dimensions, uh, concept of layering of interior spaces, such kind of uh, key uh, concepts. Um, so really here is to, to study the kind of, uh, the, the how the concept of layering and flexibility of interior space is linked to a modular kind of exterior facade system. And also moved, moved uh, the focus to the housing, uh, from the housing to the podium system, which can accommodate public specific, like theaters is, is kind of entrance hall as a, a common space playground. And really kind of whole, a range of uh, uh, kind of different programs and, and like supermarkets and, and cafe and restaurants. Um, and at deeper areas, then you can have like sports and libraries. Uh, so sort of, sort of ex exploring the, the kind of uh, um, potentials of the podium system in front of different um, interfaces, different boundaries and, and context. So eventually you, you got a kind of create a kind of landscape that uh, integrate infrastructure, green and outdoor spaces and housing to create a real kind of uh, place. Yeah, thank, thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Jean. I'm going up to share my screen. <clears throat> okay, my, uh, my topic is about uh, popular yard and creative life. The ambition is for generating a new mixed use scenario for the transformation of industrial land. Uh, aiming to uh, create an exciting neighborhood for working and living. 
If we look at some industrial environment, yard system could be identified as a basic nature of their spatial organization. Uh, even though yards appear to be rather disordered and accidental, uh, they have historical significance as uh, there are things left over from the past or uh, workspaces distributed into studios, workshops, um, or, and bars. Also, there are people who still need to work and meet in these intermediate places generated by lots of negotiations amongst the tenants. That's the basic nature of yards and where they work. Um, in this sense, we can argue that YARS is really a meaningful tool for supporting a more collective management process, as it can accommodate both low value and higher value activities uh, side by side, contributing to the preservation of our working environment. So the starting point is that these kinds of YARS occurring in the employment land are really good at dealing with this uh, diversity and irregularities because there are always conflicts between the buildings themselves and the streets, and yards help to clarify the accommodation of the inside and outside with a very clear sense of common purpose. At the same time, yards are truly negotiated domains in constant interaction with the surrounding elements. Uh, they become the continuation of the workspace and share a nature of growing by themselves. Uh, then not only, uh, not only the yards, we are thinking about how this building work. We need to consider the uh, the nature of the prefer of the industrial building's preference, um, and we might want to upgrade some of the uh, established structure to inject new production, so different players could benefit from this new mixed function environment. Um, uh, so we don't have to offer a master plan putting everything into uh, phases, which means that we can uh, start with some elements of the yards and then we can imagine how they might integrate different things over time. Also, yard could, uh, can also um, network with the canal and the railway that once served uh, the production and then uh, together forming parts of the system in the wider territory. Uh, hence, in popular, instead of residential or employment zoning, um, the objective is for workspace led regeneration, uh, aiming to create a vibrant environment where existing and emerging ingredients could coexist and thrive over time. Uh, here, a set of projects, including the relocation of existing production, in inserting new workspaces and new homes, as well as a creative hub, will start upgrading this area by valuing what Yards offers. The development is structured by three different yard systems in order to uh, remain the production and services on site while generating a new vibrant domain in the center considered as an armature accommodating uh, shared amenities and uh, changing activities. Uh, the central yard could also function as a catalyst of change allowing big things to happen, generating more value through bringing in different actors, resources and events. Then considering the whole scenario related to production processes, uh, they, uh, the big reversal is that uh, we are now asking how this yard could be lived in, not only because we need new homes, but also because residential environment could also contribute to the kinds of uh, creative industries and uh, uh, maker spaces and become the driver of change for this formal industrial yard. So the reversal is to, uh, is to show that precisely we used to exclude housing from the industrial environment, but now they can be understood as crossovers between living and working. Overall, this design lead framework is, uh, aims to establish a line of communication that asks a broader range of businesses and players their needs, um, looking for ways in which a possible transformation could build up the strength of networks to um, uh, to situate these crossovers and integrity in order to um, uh, create a vibrant yard uh, both for working environment and uh, shared resources uh, for new ways of urban living. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Yu Zhou from HNU. Uh, now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can my screen be seen clearly here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, maybe. Uh, I'm Yu Zhou, and my topic is uh, 
uh, rethinking the periphery ur urbanism through non-user land design approach. Uh, we can start with the questions like uh, how a city can think more far-sighted. For example, can we imagine the possibility that a city itself will begin to guide the way of its transformation uh, even before knowing which actors will come and uh, begin to provide the blueprints? Uh, when knowledge, uh, knowledge environment has become one of the key schemes that allow us to deal with the future challenges, uh, where actors like working, cultural space, and so on, uh, begin to pay more attention to the increasing intimate relationship with the civic life. Uh, I think we need to redefine the way in which we think about the decision-making process happen within uh, those stakeholders. Uh, so in the recent decades, we have seen often seen uh, a series of office buildings playing a, a kind of dominant role in the peripheral development uh, being begin to attract other actors and uh, together formulating a, a kind of comprehensive entity. Um, internally, they have been adapting uh, along with the working cultural change. And externally, sometimes they could act as technology parks appearing in the form of cluster buildings to elaborate a more uh, kind of general program which would serve a wider range of network participants well, sometimes they appear in the form of meta structure or kind of meta form as the headquarters of, of some giant uh, technology institutions, which are uh, highly advanced, uh, customized based on the briefs of independent. Uh, and uh, their roles are changing as well, uh, just like the exemplar uh, ANZ Center uh, provide us uh, differently. It just inspired us with the notion of being part of a city which I think allows civic life parallelly uh, happen within the working area. This kind of idea fundamentally, uh, fundamentally drives the building move to a uh, broader thinking uh, where buildings are no longer just uh, the stack of a series of uh, floor, floor plates. Uh, interestingly, we found that back to the early 1960s, uh, the idea, this kind of idea of part and whole has already been announced from a different uh, perspective that is the metabolism. Uh, the metabolism or the metabolists, uh, they denied the notion of constant and isolated architecture, uh, thinking of architecture from a broader perspective as part of the life, life cycle of the city and which are uh, connected to the urban infrastructure, indicating sometimes as mega structure or sometimes as, as uh, group forms. As time goes by, as needs changed, uh, they would be able to uh, to do self-renewal to uh, avoid a kind of dying from being unadaptable to the future. Uh, this kind of, uh, this, uh, this movement inspired us uh, with a series of conversations which uh, show a very clear morphological starting point, just like what OMA did in 19, uh, like 1996 in the Universal Headquarter and also what Ollie Sharon did uh, in the competition of uh, Olympic companies in London. Um, um, they, 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 they morphologically, they shared a, a lot of similarities with what metabolists uh, proposed in the 1960s, just like uh, uh, Kenzo Tangi did, proposing um, a kind of adaptability to the changing scale and, uh, and uncertain uh, cooperated models. So uh, in the design workshop, we made a test at Brentford area in West London, testing about a kind of non-user lab design approach. In this peripheral area, we see great potentials and the restrictions, not going to go detailed here. Uh, we also see development that are mostly standing alone and concentrated along a strip called Great West Corridor. Um, so when we zoom in, uh, uh, we find a unique triangular site for this test, which is segregated between the two infrastructures, like M4 and the railway. And only when coming closer can we find the, exi uh, the uh, existence of the Brentford station, uh, which disappeared uh, in, the, in the urban fabric with no legibility to encourage any micro movement. So uh, one way to imagine is that this location or this site is an attractive port for a new headquarters for big company, uh, which would work not only for a single occupier, but it might become integrator that would inspire other partnerships. 
Uh, meanwhile, cases like the Yellow Building and the residents, uh, the researchers' residents, uh, inspired us with rich possibility of the internal programs like office researching and even housing, uh, establishing great flexibility under a similar type, uh, typological starting point. Another case like the Tong Tong Hall project uh, did by BIG offered us a way uh, in which we gathered those typological opportunities uh, to morphologically create a more adaptable grouping and regrouping ability for the transformation of the unexpected partnerships. Um, in this sense, uh, we look back to the triangular side. One way to imagine is that speculative, uh, uh, one way to imagine is that a, a, a kind of speculative assemblage will be a new home for potential users who are even currently unknown and even without any final decision has been made. We can see a huge diversity of the occupants will be intimately integrated within a set of long-term shared with typological variation, but morphological consistency. The, on the other hand, uh, in this side, we question that uh, the Brentford station only offer access to nothing but a place for come and go. So just like uh, uh, what most of the other uh, station buildings are doing. Meanwhile, we, we also see a set of cases as transportation structures begin to inter integrate with the communities more closely. So in, in the test, in this sense, instead of uh, being a shed uh, where you can only accommodate a set of waiting area or shops, what is proposed here is uh, it's a new uh, type of event-led station building with its uh, second ground and multi-layered landscape, uh, which would begin to change the way in which uh, it is associated with the uh, surrounding and uh, the civic life. Uh, it also could, could, could be like an integrator making crossovers with coexisting contexts, uh, which were segregated by the infrastructures. We can imagine not only it would uh, provide scenarios like parking space to accommodate the growing intensity of the future actors, but also it could accommodate these spaces like uh, sports, arts, uh, shows, and retails, and so on, uh, being as a sharing space for a wider talent-based urban area. Together, those actors, all those actors, would begin to group a sort of non-user-led assemblage with a multi-orientational collaboration pattern and uh, being as a driver to advocate to activate a cluster of rethinking partnerships, by doing which we might achieve a series of what could be thought as uh, the requalification of the periphery, not only in terms of uh, different urban scenarios, but more we would really be able to see uh, the requalified peripheral civic life in the wider range of the uh, urban context. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. I'll share my screen. Um, can you all see that? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm sorry. Okay, uh, so I will also be looking at the changes in office buildings, but from a different perspective. How we live in cities is changing and we are all sort of wondering about that. What we do, what we share, where we work, in short, we wonder about what are good residential environments and how we can reach them. But are we really building differently? As a response to the housing crisis, we have observed a surge in the transformation of obsolete office stock into residential buildings. This has called attention because of its substandard qualities and it's as a very bad production. However, vacant office spells are its recently built, well-serviced and segregated located assets. Especially after COVID-19, the unsustainable nature of the city center and its current configuration in its current configuration was kind of obvious. The most coveted, serviced, and expensive locations were emptied out for months, revealing an inefficient use of resources. But could vacancy be an opportunity to test more adequate or more ambitious ways of living? As a program, we build on a material practice that reasons from project to project, learning on the existing and reconstructing its meaning. I looked at the pretty, the nondescript examples, the bad and the ugly, the products of the permitted development rights that have enabled all from luxury housing to nine square meter one bedroom apartments in Harlow. 
And while some may be more ambitious, connecting the existing transport network, catering for a growing number of young professionals in an area, providing workspace and service living, the conventional apartments and the non-existent urban ambition pop up in these projects. And I'm convinced of a building's capacity to create long-term value through incremental change, an attitude that needs to be present in both reconversions and new projects. But where to test this? How can a way of thinking about the transformation of form and type help, look at, help us look forward? Can we do it by building up what is already there? Up until now, we have reconverted a first generation of office space that has become obsolete because of its dimensions and technical requirements. So what could be next? Could it be that the deep office floor plate we occupy today might support new ways of living in the future? And by deep floor office floor plate, I mean large surfaces like this 40 by 90 meter uh, floor plate of office space in King's Cross. Um, my testing building was this and thinking about the open plan and two central cores. By looking at the deep floor plate, I wonder about this capacity to become a new loft and each other in repetition that creates territories for a smooth unfolding of new processes, as Cole has said in his 1995 essay, The Typical Plan. I, look at, I looked at its structural, technical, and spatial characteristics, how we can dismantle the office tower so we can see it as a platform for innovative living typologies. The existing is not a restrictive framework then, but something that enables and provokes new spatial organizations. Looking at involving new actors and promoting innovation without demanding tabula rasa, understanding the value of continuities within a city's culture. Through this research, I looked at presence and how they propose new domestic arrangements and proof depth can support a blended living and working scheme that can take advantage of the depth of the deep plan to enable a shared living community. The open plan can be occupied with the flexibility of flat construction methods, enabling typological change and spatial play, evolution through time, and changes within the familiar configuration. Also, is different in differentiation conditions might just be ideal for a shared living that is based around allowing the user to do more by being part of a community. So if predictions indicate that up to 40% of existing workspace might become vacant after COVID, and if already 100,000 of new homes in London were produced in this way, the opportunity and the responsibility to look at this kind of projects is huge, and not only here, but across the globe. This exercise for me was as a last piece uh, in housing and urbanism. Uh, I helped to consolidate the understanding of the existing and reorienting its meaning. How can modesty and cross-scale thinking help us think of major transformations of the places we live in? And in a way, all four of our projects have shown how thinking from the project to a city and across great, bad and average conditions that can be for us, we can deconstruct our meaning and reimagine their future. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much to all four of you. Um, I think we should try to be fairly quick here to make it back onto schedule or sort of close to it. Are there any questions? I've got kind of a longer question that I might save uh, till the end because it's kind of a larger question about urbanism uh, in the postgraduate program, like among or across postgraduate programs. But maybe I'll save that. Anyone? I'll, I'll say, like you, I'll save mine to, to the end there. Um, maybe to respond to Larry's comment about the, the faith in the project as a, a transformative device for um, architecture in the city. Sounds good. Yeah, I was, I was struck by what Carolina said at the end about the existing uh, and what role that plays in thinking about the city. But maybe we can make that a larger discussion at the end. Anyone? Um, Hello? Hi. Um, yeah, I found it interesting, like how, especially the last project is also dealing with uncertainty and change, but through, well, obviously different uh, 
like different situation, different approach. But uh, yeah, it can be interesting to discuss like um, maybe the way to deal with change. Um, it can be, yeah, indeed, like embedded more deeply in, in our architectural practices, such as um, kind of leading to more uh, adaptive and interactive architecture. Uh, I mean, yeah, c coming from DRL, that's that would be probably my opinion on on the topic. But it's um, yeah, it's really interesting indeed that also, especially the last work was uh, around the crisis, right? What, what that was brought by Corona and uh, like um, yeah, it, it's I, I I really found it quite curious to like see the work and. Uh, uh, and really trying to make sense, you know, of, out of uh, what happened, and uh, because indeed the situation was like way out of normal. Uh, but I, I guess my opinion is also that like we have so many situations like this, but not just all of them uh, have you know enough media attention, and um, yeah, like an architecture be like stays uh, really static and. Uh, uh, like yeah, unresponsive to this kind of uncertainty, and uh, I would say yeah, like not well if disaster scenarios as well, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Angelina. Would any of you like to quickly respond? Or I hope that in the discussion at the end we can have a proper big uh, inter-program debate on uh, flexibility, responsiveness, the existing change, everything. I think we'll we'll save that. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I, for the for the end, we, I, I think it's very interesting how the links between programs in those terms can really help us see uh, different strategies. And we sort of gave us, a, I think, a, a preview of where we were to announce a program in terms of how we can adapt and think of existing projects, both to to build a new and to to rethink about the, the existing structures. So. Thinking from project to project, I think that was kind of the idea to, to point out that something we can build on across programs as well. That's very interesting. Great. Well, we'll pick up more on that uh, soon, I hope. So the next uh, program, we have Emergent Technologies and Design. Uh, we've got, I think we're spoiled for uh, people in the program today. Would any of you like to quickly introduce the program? Uh, Milad or Alif? Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, hello. Um, first of all, I, I would like to uh, thank Mark, Belinda, Michael, uh, Raj, uh, William, Elena for giving us this opportunity to showcase our work and our research. Uh, I'm Elif Adene. I'm the Director of Emerging Technologies and Design, MTech, and I'm joined by Michael Weissok, who you have all met, the founding director. <laughs> and Mila Chokarpash, our studio master. <laughs> so um, yeah, just to um, give a brief introduction about uh, MTech, um, we're an interdisciplinary um, research studio um, uh, coming from different backgrounds, uh, mostly architecture and various types of engineering. Uh, we offer Master of Science and Master of Architecture degrees. We conduct our research as a team. It's always team-based research. And our main um, focus is um, exploring, let's say, emergent technologies and workflows for emerging problems in the world. And how do we deal with that? We, um, we explore um, physical prototyping as well as advanced computational workflows to, to address, uh, like I mentioned, these uh, emerging issues in the world. Um, we, we do love building, we do love prototyping and exploring uh, new material systems and working with various material systems. Uh, and we like to couple those to, uh, as I mentioned, advanced computational methods and simulations and various types of analyses. Uh, we learn from nature, we uh, study natural systems and uh, we work with um, evolutionary computation, various types of simulations in our uh, workflows. And um, of course the ultimate goal the ultimate goal for us here is to develop uh, a multi-scalar design approach uh, to address some of the most pressing problems in the world, such as you know, lack of biodiversity, climate change, um, emerging immigration patterns, change of uh, density, change of populations, 
And um, we explore these uh, through um, local material scales, architecture, urbanism, ecology, so on and so forth. And so before I um, hand the floor over to our alumni, uh, Stephen, Berin, and Tebolina, I, I'll just mention briefly what their research was about. Um, so um, it's called High Tectonic City, and they were interested in exploring a resilient approach for a high density settlement, in this case, uh, the context of Tokyo, uh, which um, is uh, facing a high levels of flooding. And uh, they um, explored uh, systems on, again, multiple scales, starting from the base scale to architecture to local material scales. And they explored this generative system for a duration of uh, 50 years. And so, uh, again, I would like to say welcome to everyone, and I'll give the floor to Dane, Devolin, and Stephen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ale. Uh, I can share the screen. I guess you can see the full screen now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello everyone, we are a team presenting our dissertation project called High Tectonic City. We are a team of MRCs from the MTech program. The tsunami is a marine disaster that has affected human settlements for decades. It is one of the most destructive yet the most unpredictable disasters in human history. The regions that lie within the ring of fire that is highly active tectonic zones are the most vulnerable. Yet, these coastal developments are home to millions and some are very well developed. We choose Tokyo Bay as our context for further research. Tokyo is one of the most developed coastal cities situated at the northern part of the Tokyo Bay. It is also one of the densest in the world. The bay is one of the busiest trade and commerce networks with six major ports. The reclaimed lands for the majority of the urban financial businesses and industries that are very vulnerable to the economy. But its geomorphology is such that it also makes the day prone to tsunami and water surges due to earthquakes and underwater landslides, as we can see on the maps. Uh, Debolina? Yeah. Tokyo's defense system consists of multiple seawalls, dikes, floodgates, inland locks, which are capable of stopping the water flow. Yet these solutions create a feeling of imprisonment and disconnect with the sea. With rise in sea levels, they too need raising. Areas currently identified by the authorities are in Tokyo Kanagawa Prefecture, marked in blue circles, and need raising in future to protect the low-lying areas behind. A test simulation conducted on remapped areas shows their vulnerability and heavy surge in water in adjacent areas and on land. An analysis of the existing network distribution and build forms suggests low resilience against a sudden influx of water in case of damage in the defenses. So all the analysis lead us to the following research questions. Can tectonic surfaces with channeling capabilities aligned with coastal protection help in creating a more resilient urban fabric to deal with marine disasters? And can mixed-use modular spaces be evolved on the new urban fabric to work with the new water network and build conditions required to cope with the marine disasters? And so we propose our hypothesis, gradients of intervention integrated strategically offshore to inland can create a resilient marine defense system and build environment for future Tokyo City. To further our research and experiments, we divide our strategies into three scales of intervention, base scale, intermediary, and local scale. We propose strategies such as barrier placement to dissipate the wave energy at the base scale, water guiding techniques at the intermediary scale, and integrating new urban fabric with the inflow of water at the local scale. To do so, we do multiple tests. So at the base scale, you can go to the next slide. Uh, for the extraction of zones at the base scale for barrier placement, 
We run a script that combines all overlays values according to density, water velocity, and elevation gradients. In the end, we get four zones, out of which Tokyo Kanagawa is one of them and is selected as it has the most density. For the barrier experiment setups of barriers, we model the land with the center channel with the shown sizes. And it is done uh, taking into consideration a potential five meter high tsunami flow. And CFD tests were conducted on mouth of the island and lowering tests are done to reduce the individual lengths of the barriers so that multiple small barriers can work together and enrich the embankment as well. So these are some more CFDs done for the edges of the barriers. Curved ones are best at handling the water pressure and are prone to least damage. And post these tests, we find that uh, we also need an extension mound that could create a breeding ground for species like mollusks and small fishes that exist in the Bay Area and create a habitat. As the barriers are placed in and around Tsukushima Island, ship routes are also taken care of for the existing and modified channels. This is a small video showing the placement. So finally, the module is designed to repeat uh, throughout the bay shoreline to act as a defense to display the wave energy in order for the water to enter the channels at a slow pace. And other than that, also act as an intertidal habitat for species. Um, over to you, Stephen. Yes, could you go to the next page? Uh, in the intermediate scale, please. Uh, we uh, simulate different tsunami scenarios on our sites, and we systematically study how channeling strategies and uh, uh, river sections can help us to dissipate more water energy. We base on this study to form our uh, strategies. Next slide. Based on these principles, we lo relocated the evacuation zones and modified river channels using genetic algorithm to, uh, for the citizen's safety. This is how the new uh, modified river channel will look like. And finally, for rebuilding the transportation network and evacuation network, we studied five types of networks out of which we found that the neural network grid based on leaf rains optimized uh, based on criteria like minimum negative parcels created, et cetera, and are implemented uh, the same on one part of the bay. Uh, we made a building aggregation system in, in local scale. Uh, we select a pentagonal pattern for the building aggregation system because of its unique uh, ge geometric property and its uh, spatial quality. And uh, here, as designers, we can uh, control the number of uh, residential clusters. We can control the number of the residential units and visualize the environmental impact of uh, each result. This will help us make our final decision according to the uh, environmental influence and uh, statistic data. And this will further inform the next uh, iteration of uh, building aggregation. Based on the aggregation result, we further develop the buildings uh, in terms of uh, structure and interior detail. Um, so, um, this is showing the combined modifications that can be done in phases in gaps of 25 years to develop the relationship between the shoreline with the water channels and, the, and further with the built farms with proper transportation network and evacuation zones. This is an overview of the low and mid rises through the channel where we can see the integration of the soft tissue and the built environment together. 
Uh, that simulation is showing up the five meter of inundation on the tertiary channels in case of storm surge. Um, and this is showing the public spaces where we have the low rises on the soft tissue, which we distributed the details and other functions. And here we can see the architecture and landscape. So the uh, low rises and the mid rises along the channel with the uh, public area. Through the channel. And thank you for listening us. Thank you. It's very interesting. Uh, and again, so many, so many themes and connections to, to previous projects. I haven't seen any questions in the chat. I just want to put out another reminder that everyone can uh, can enter a question there. If you don't want to speak uh, or turn your camera on, one of us will read it out. Everyone is furiously typing and we'll have to wait. Yes. <laughs> no. I'm curious uh, about program. Um, at the end of the day, uh, maybe picking up on a, a comment or earlier in the afternoon about the aggregation of the units. How do you, in your selection of a site, how do you think about urban form uh, as a context on top of all the other contexts you're considering? And I guess maybe this is kind of a, a large question, but how do you judge fitness uh, in relation to existing urban context, urban form, urban morphology? Um, actually, um, this is a good question, and I think it's a tough one for, for us. Uh, actually, uh, the, the contextual environment was, wasn't really well addressed in our project because, firstly, we tried to uh, address the um, potential risk of the tsunami and uh, our solution is to uh, modify the river channel and introduce a new kind of land morphology. Uh, we did consider the existing uh, urban network, the, the building morphologies uh, at the beginning, but we find that a uh, regular grid network can uh, hardly uh, fit well with uh, our proposed uh, new channels, new morphologies, etc. So we, uh, the solution we are providing is kind of just bringing a new uh, uh, radical thinking to the the the, the urban. Uh, we uh, the units like the the spatial logic comes from uh, traditional uh, uh, Japanese uh, Ogawa. Uh, like the, the, the their garden, their, the, the spatial connections, we, uh, we learn from it. But uh, in terms of uh, material and in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the, the contextual connection is, is not that strong in our project, I have to say that. Uh, and besides, I wanna add that the reason that we made the whole process in five phases is actually not to destroy the urban fabric, at once. So we are replacing everything one by one because also the concrete buildings have their own um, uh, lifespans. So we detect those uh, urban uh, uh, urban features of the area and then made our phase and zoning according to this. So uh, we are doing these tertiary channels one by one and then changing the uh, existing um, build environment according to uh, the existing issue. 
So we are kind of respecting what is there. You know, maybe, uh, Will, if I could jump in there, I think that there's something I, I think quite fascinating about the way in which um, riparian environments and urban systems come together. And, uh, you know, there's a, a long tradition of the, of the little creeks and tributaries uh, always having a slightly different organization uh, than the, the surrounding urban territory. And I think you're, you're, you're actually quite in keeping with that. Um, and how these, uh, how these forms adapt to one another over time, I think becomes fascinating. So, um, you know, in, in a way by initiating the argument by starting with the, the challenge of, of the river is, um, is itself, I think actually one of the um, sort of traditional approaches to the development of new kinds of urban environments. So I, I think you may be more contextual than you realize. Yeah, following on from, from that, um, congratulations, really beautiful project. And um, the, um, for me, the interesting bit is how you kept the balance between rigorous research, what you clearly did, and um, design, because um, it's always nice to see uh, rigorous research, but often that ends up in not too rigorous design, but you manage to do both. So how did you do that management? That's really like, how do you negotiate it constantly between research, um, scripting and all that towards the design and so on as a process? I think it's a teamwork and like back and forth process, like for the whole uh, eight months. Yeah, but the design part was a part of the whole process, but it mostly shaped through the end of the project. I think maybe something that could be of interest to kind of situate the work is, is in terms of the kinds of conversations that you want to have uh, with other designers. In, in some ways, two things came to mind. Uh, one was, I think, a lot of the struggles of the metabolists to engage in kind of cellular forms and larger scale kind of urban interventions. And mm -hmm. Kenzo Tangi and the Tokyo Bay work and, and so forth, I think are obviously complementary things that you guys could speak to. And the other thing was that uh, when Piano did his uh, Kansai airport and the issue of actually creating larger masses, uh, kind of artificial grounds and territories that may be of interest for you guys to have a look at um, because they had to really design kind of strategies for the system uh, to really consider how buildings would change with the kind of fluvial forms and all of the other things that are changing that kind of idea of a new ground. So I think there, there are kinds of ways, I think, of kind of engaging different kinds of conversations. And, and I think it's an interesting opportunity to see the work and uh, in some sense, to kind of open up those discussions and discourses, especially as the issue of time came up and you guys are speaking very much about phasing. Uh, there, there. It would be interesting to see how you think of time maybe different from the metabolists. Well, congratulations. Thank you. I see we've had a couple questions put in the chat, but I think those, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, are sort of intended for the closing open discussion. Uh, I wanna thank uh, this group. Thanks for, for responding to the question. And thanks Larry for your intervention there too. And I totally agree that you, you do actually have a thinking about context and uh, you don't need to, um, I mean, I think one of the larger things we wanna talk about later is how there are different paradigms for understanding urbanism. Uh, and so you don't need to assume context means a certain thing. I just wanted to kind of push that uh, discussion into being. Okay, so the next, uh, next we have design and make. So I'll pass to Zach. That's great. Thank you, Will. Um, thanks, Raj, Will, Alan, and everyone who's had a part in bringing this together today. Um, I'm Zach. I, I'm a lead tutor in the MRC strand for the Design and Make program with a few extra hats, uh, including leading the Hook Park site and also the AA's recently launched Wood Lab. Um, away from the city, Design and Make students explore design at the point of physical production. Our forest home, I'm sitting there now, 
contains houses, workshops, and diverse experts, which together enable our students to pursue ambitious design build projects, primarily from the trees surrounding. Through 2020 and 21, we've been uniquely grateful to have around 20 acres of property per student in this forest home. And this facility has fundamentally enabled us to continue work in person to stay on the tools. And so hopefully Seb's work in a minute will show some of that. I'm pleased to introduce our graduate from the MSc program, Seb Birch, who'll be joining us today to present his dissertation work conducted during the first months of the pandemic. Seb's project is quite frankly, a personal favorite of mine from recent years. In it, he engages with the program's previous research on the use of 3D scanning and robotics on unusual bits of wood, but he does so with large scale manufacturing in mind rather than simply the architectural one-off. I won't wreck its name because it's quite a good one, but I'll leave it to Seb. Thanks very much for having us. Uh, thanks, Zach. Um, I'll share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yeah. Okay. Um, right, so um, the project is entitled uh, Dense Packed Timber Blocks, Mass Timber Construction with Irregular Crown Timbers, um, and Building on hook, Hooks history of challenging the way we build with timber um, due to its uh, unique setting. Um, project investigated how irregular crown timbers, currently a waste product, could be used to make a reproducible, minimally processed building product um, as a kind of speculation on the possible integration of modern tools and technologies into the timber supply chain to bring about um, alternative ways of thinking about our timber resources. It's a project driven by physical prototyping and testing, um, enabled by the availability of loose crown material in the woodland. Um, found timbers are packed together and connected with wooden dowels, and the resulting aggregations can be shaped to make blocks, and these blocks can be assembled as a system. Um, the future of timber construction probably looks something like this. Um, CLT is to a large extent considered the future of timber building. Uh, that's because it's a great material. Um, it's light, fast, cost efficient, and makes use of a low value material, um, i.e. softwood. Um, and there's also a carbon cycle argument relevant to CLT and other engineered timber products, uh, where locking carbon into timber products and into our buildings can prevent the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, however, it isn't perfect. CLT has a mostly overlooked perversity in being described as a sustainable material of the future because it still relies entirely on a centralized, highly industrial form of production um, when more distributed manufacturing chains could be more appropriate if we want to reduce the embodied energy of our timber products. Um, so there's some absurdity in that two th in 2018, 6% of all CLT production was happening within a 100 kilometer radius in Austria. Um, and there's also some fundamental concerns related to forestry, which became particularly um, evident being in Hook Park, where um, the forms of timber production available to us promote a homogenization of timber and don't value its inherent variation. Uh, and this in turn doesn't fit with the projection for the UK's future timber stock, which is going to need to be well designed, diverse. Um, and there's also a question of how to deal with the resources we have now. Um, in the UK, there's a high proportion of broadleaf woodland, 37% um, versus 42%, which is conifer. Um, the vast majority of which has gone through a period of under management like Cook Park and therefore um, has lots of these irregular um, forking uh, trees. Um, so maybe we should be thinking about whether we can integrate this local resource into our production chains. Um, and also we should be avoiding current practices like clear felling, um, which leave trees potentially vulnerable to disease and soil erosion. Um, if we're gonna be designing our forests with goals of biodiversity and resilience in mind, um, perhaps working with a broader range of timber products, which allow more selective woodland management um, would be more appropriate. Um, 
In the past, far more integrated systems of extraction and use existed, uh, where carpenters had a much more zero waste approach to trees and a diverse range of forestry product, products were um, employed. Um, so a key question in the project was, could we be thinking about restructuring industrial practices to include some of this sensitivity which used to exist? Um, and of course, I'm building on existing research strands at Hook. Um, the workshop and prototype house built um, in 1989 um, on the campus uh, set the agenda for using low value timber to give an economic incentive to thinning procedures, um, a management process which is necessary for growing straight timber. Um, so I guess the question that came from that was uh, wondering whether there's a low value material which could incite the growth of more complex resilient forest um, forests, which are kind of a current goal. Um, another key precedent a hook is the Woodchip Barn, um, constructed in two, 2016, um, which attempted to use otherwise waste timber, i.e. forks, um, by 3D scanning them and therefore enabling their assembly into an extraordinary digital uh, structure. Um, and the project also had the broader ambition to create a survey of available tree forms which could then be integrated in the, into the supply chain. Um, however, I guess the gap that I saw in the research was this um, focus on delivering whole bespoke systems rather than prefabricated installable parts, um, which one could argue are detached from the demands of the current building industry, which is sort of more concerned with cost than craft. Um, so the research question I then set myself for the year was um, what could a new kind of timber product designed to make better use of available resources and to enable more sustainable forest look like very loud noise. Um, and yeah, I guess speculating on an alternative way of thinking about the resources available to us and um, beginning to test some of the technologies um, which could enable a different idea of distributed manufacture using local wood um, and aimed at a more sort of implementable construction. And yeah, so kind of what I've just said, starting with these three ideas, um, that timber products could be uh, diverse, um, suited to local resources, could work together with the natural variation of timber and would rely on um, distributed chains of manufacture. Um, early on in the year, I became interested in um, using the crown timbers of beech trees as a building material. Um, in terms of volume, they're, on average, they make up about half the tree. Um, so if you're talking about a carbon argument, uh, this, if we were to use this material, you could uh, double the amount of carbon which could be sequestered um, if we were to build with these timber, with these timbers. Um, and as I said, the project was driven through prototyping and intuitive work in the workshop. So relying on the proximity of available materials and the possibility of experimentation that hook allows, um, I uh, created these pieces, um, these first ones, looking at integrating found timbers with squared sections, um, playing with the shaping of timbers as joining elements, um, looking at how irregular timbers could replace regular ones, and making larger pieces which would explore different, which explored um, different jointing techniques um, for making blocks or uh, building elements. Um, which then led me to um, explorations of how you could um, densely uh, arrange uh, these irregular materials, which had like a lot of um, digital uh, possibility. Um, and yeah, so I ended up at one-to-one -one scale making up making um, these DAO connected aggregative dense blocks, which didn't have any need for uh, joint cutting. Um, which could then be milled flat and used as building blocks. Um, and ultimately with a similar, as a product, <laughs> um, having a similar ambition to CLT in terms of providing a simple fast building solution using low value material, um, but with a radically different fabrication approach. Um, and in turn responding to the idea that small scale CLT building is often over-engineered and has the possibility to, repl to be replaced by a different product. Um, and so I guess initially um, to uh, create the argument for doing this research, 
I made some volume comparisons um, speculatively, um, which revealed that um, you could use an equivalent amount of uh, hardwood timber to um, conifer timber to create the um, volume of a terraced house um, with the system. Um, at this stage, I then zoomed out. Um, the exercise I set myself wasn't about gesturing towards um, the whole process, but rather um, picking moments um, which I could uh, then explore. Um, so uh, I categorized the different um, procedures which would be involved in making the product, um, extracting the timber, documenting the timbers uh, in 3D, assembling them robotically, then shaping them, transporting them, and construction. Um, and I began uh, to map these ideas um, sort of fairly intuitively uh, organized on a scale of pragmatism uh, and sort of began then to uh, pick elements which I wanted to test. Um, so yeah, uh, in case it isn't clear, uh, the idea is a vision system, robotic assembly line, uh, possibly imagined as a portable vehicle, um, which would then be followed by shaping and assembling to create the blocks. Um, and it was, I sort of used drawing to um, interrogate what that might mean um, and sort of gesture to the uh, bigger picture of the uh, process. Um, so this drawing shows us all, uh, how the factory might look that could produce these blocks. Uh, I also thought about the architectural implications of the building system as sort of an initial exploration of its possibilities. So um, categorized uh, three different building types which could exist, uh, a sort of very prosaic exposed construction, perhaps the um, dense blocks would be concealed within a wall construction or um, they could be exposed externally with insulation behind with an overhanging roof. Of course, this is a very, um, just a, just the beginning of ex its explorations. And I wanted to focus more on the actual fabrication which Hook allowed. Um, so yeah, my ambition at Hook wasn't to directly realize the imagined process, but rather use the resources available um, to test moments from uh, this uh, process. And um, this was explored through the construction of a final prototype, which tests the DTBs as a wall system. Um, and this was in this final exercise was informed by other physical and digital tests. Um, yeah, and the end result is kind of a demonstration both of the reproducible possibilities of the system, but also uh, celebrates the one off performative nature of the prototype and the possibility of the tools available at Hook. Um, so, how do they actually go about doing this? Um, I sourced material from the woodland um, following thinning operations, um, uh, so here taking one beach crown roughly after the summer's thinning, um, ash timbers were connect collected in a similar, similar way in the end I had two crowns which I could use. Um, in anticipation of a robotic pick in place packing procedure, uh, I imagined that branches could be machined once sourced, um, a square tenon could be um, cut to the branches, which would enable easier grabbing robotically and would allow them placed in free space. Um, but being of a much smaller scale um, than their imagined industrial counterpart, um, the packing that I carried out a hook um, was by hand and um, pieces were iteratively placed and dowed in three places to create an aggregation. Um, and as a way of rationalizing my intuitive process, I used precise filming uh, to analyze my, what I was doing and um, began to be strict with my own physical action. So computationally speaking, I'm working within a set of three loops, uh, a spot in the aggregation is chosen, a piece of timber is chosen, uh, an appropriate looking timber is chosen, and then checked against the spot in three different orientations. And if that, that doesn't work, you cycle to the next piece of timber. Um, and so in response to that, um, I wrote a 2D packing algorithm using um, an evolutionary solver. Um, here uh, through a series of rotations and uh, by drawing a medial skeleton in the 2D space, um, pieces can be um, added to the aggregation, um, which I then took to 
a sort of sort of working algorithm. Um, but um, I mean, the end result is still slightly limited. But at that point, I decided that I would um, rather than going down that rabbit hole, focus on the actual fabrication uh, because the exercise kind of deemed that uh, this kind of 3D nesting would definitely be possible. Um, so yeah, uh, looking at the block, uh, an obvious thing that I had to um, figure out was actually how to join them. Um, and I did some digital analysis, which looked at um, how these um, pieces of timber were actually uh, connected to each other and what, what their uh, properties were as block. Um, and a key problem to overcome with uh, this block <laughs> was that um, only two of the connections were fully integrated into the um, aggregation and lots of them were sort of on the edge. So um, I needed to develop a joining method which would allow, uh, which would um, kind of allow for this irregularity at the faces. Um, and I also did some preliminary stress analysis which confirmed the idea that um, certain key members uh, which had many connections were actually um, and went all the way through the block were actually the ones doing all the work and the rest of the block was kind of, um, the rest of the material in the block was just holding them together. Um, so I guess that analysis led me to uh, fairly intuitively um, want to test uh, blocks which had different um, arrangements of packing, sort of different uh, primary directions. So um, in the final prototype, uh, I attempted to take the analysis I'd done further um, so could a system with directional blocks, diagonally oriented blocks or porous ones be made uh, as a sort of series of architectural components um, suited to different architectural applications? And um, the success of that was kind of tested in the end with 3D scanning. Um, these are all the blocks before they were milled. So um, to build them, I uh, aggregated large, which would kind of be an industrial way of doing it. Um, aggregated these large um, combinations of these timbers and then cut them with a wood miser um, and then used the robotically mounted bandsaw uh, to finish the blocks um, because it was the tool available. Um, but uh, instead of just cutting straight edges uh, because the tool has these obvious freeform capabilities, um, that was something I wanted to integrate into my prototype which resulted in the possibility of creating a series of um, individually cut blocks. Um, one thing that wasn't tested in the prototype and um, is perhaps a obvious real world application of the DTBs is um, them working as a hybrid system with other materials. So on the right, you can see a block that's been filled with hempcrete as a uh, insulative material, but you can imagine that you could blow really any kind of cellulose um, or any kind of other uh, natural, preferably insulation material into the cavities between the timbers. And on the left, you can see a lined block, uh, which could be more structurally um, efficient. Um, yeah, so these are some of the prototypes I made. Um, and I also experimented with different joining techniques. So uh, how would these blocks actually uh, connect together? Uh, and the one I ended up going for was uh, a sort of mortise pin connection, which would stop uh, the blocks from sliding from one, from on top of one another. Uh, and in the prototype, the um, blocks are sort of um, layered on top of each other in a um, sort of a brick-like pattern um, to enable them to stick together with this pin. Um, so as I said, the freeform uh, side of the wall celebrates the possibilities of the tools at hook. And it's also bespoke. Um, but its aim is about sort of gesturing towards the possible industrial processes. Um, in comparison with my original estimate of 11 uh, tree crowns, I actually used 72. Uh, if I were to extrapolate this up to the volume of the house, I would have to use 72 crowns. Um, so, but there was quite a lot of waste in um, the processes I used, so that could definitely be refined. Uh, the system is also very heavy and sometimes delicate at the edges. Um, but I mean, primarily, um, I think it's a success because sort of a as a provocation towards future developments, um, possibly writing a packing algorithm for 3D forms could enable more optimized packing procedures and reduce waste um, and anticip anticipate things like dowel placement um, and perhaps uh, indicates uh, 
a broadening of the timber production chain um, to change the reliance on products which currently dominate. So um, I guess where I want to go now with it is uh, looking at other materials uh, which are currently considered logging residues um, or results of other management practices like coppicing or pollarding um, and how could we use a more creative reading of the resources and technologies available to engage with these materials too. Thanks. Thanks. Wow. That's all right. <laughs> Pick up sticks next level. Yeah. There's so well, much. I guess, um, well, that, look, it's I very just, sort of inefficient, I guess. I just want to signal what one comment um, because I'm aware of time. Um, again, this notion of provocation and working between the pragmatic and the fantastic and it's possible industrial iterations or applications. We know that with COP26, you know, the REDD plus um, agenda is going to be quite, um, it's going to be at the forefront in terms of what and how forests um, are able to contribute in terms of um, emissions reductions. And I think in terms of, you know, valuing the work and the research that you and Hook um, are doing together in terms of building on past research and also future casting in terms of um, other trajectories. I think this work is quite seminal in actually opening up that ground. And so it's to kind of, at which point do you disseminate um, some of these findings, some of the actual limits of what you've encountered to this wider audience, whoever or um, whatever it might be, and I guess I'm, I'm trying to find a link between your project and um, the first project we saw this morning um, in which this notion of building alliance was kind of a fundamental um, undercurrent in the work that was being produced and proposed. So I guess it's sort of moving or trying to place and articulate the contribution of your research with your colleagues at Hook within a wider domain beyond the algorithm itself in terms of understanding or re reviewing what forests are and do, and how we understand timber, timber value, uh, other other products from the for that might come from the forest. I mean, yeah, and also what the, I mean, this idea of collaboration with um, a diverse range of people um, with a diverse range of skills is really something that Hook is all about. Um, unlike, I guess whether you're from an architectural background or an engineer or whatever, like being able to be in the forest and uh, work with your hands with this material is like a, a quite a, a life-changing experience, I would say. Um, and like, I think as designers, um, I think uh, we need to have engendered that kind of responsibility, which, um, you know, working and living in a woodland enables you to, um, have. <laughs> I guess what I'm also wanting to claim the space for is that events like this are not just about, you know, the kind of 10 minute presentation of your project, but to really try and build these networks and moments of exchange, whether it's through the chat and indeed beyond the chat group here amongst you, other programs, other, other um, you know, groupings of, 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 um, of research that other students have been doing to really mobilize and give these projects an afterlife. Because I think that that is what we're endeavoring to do as a school and through these sorts of events is to really build those or to offer platforms and opportunities to engage and build those alliances beyond the singular event. Otherwise, you know, it becomes quite a sort of um, um, a closed uh, loop. And I, I'm, all of these projects are showing that there is life beyond the Zoom meeting and it's for you to structure those points of contact then. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I'm definitely up for some collaboration if anyone uh, wants to. <laughs> yeah, maybe, um, Raj, that's something that we could do also is offer, if, of course, people are willing to share their kind of contact details, is to sort of offer those points of contact on uh, kind of conversation or uh, con of conversation beyond the format of this meeting, which might be a good a good way of enabling this to happen. Yeah, if I may, um, I would I would like to um, yeah like say that it's amazing work uh, and congratulate you. Uh, I I really appreciate that um, 
let's say your rigor in research that you tried like so many things and like searching for you know like multiple ways of how to use this uh, well i wouldn't say waste but well yeah something that uh, was maybe um yeah underrated somehow and uh, uh, not fully considered in uh, like building technology field um yeah i i really liked the approach which is more like ecological thinking let's say um by that i mean more holistic um something like Bateson sort of thing um and uh, i i in my opinion i think like of course it's not the beginning but uh, i see it also coming like somewhere where maybe you can i don't know try to instead of maybe cutting these beautiful curved trees into like boxes maybe um trying to i don't know you know like find the morphology that comes naturally from like this anisotropic material basically well it's it's kind of assemblage right um of yeah like all of these forces inside and i would say um in your in your like primary version you have two materials right which is timber and another is air and maybe how like these two materials um yeah they create you know all of these forces and what kind of like architectural formation that uh, can come after that because um yeah like it it really feels somehow um like forcing it to put it you know some kind of um yeah like typo uh, typologies that we all are used to um more like yeah traditional house or like boxes or something but um maybe the next point of the research you know could be like really trying to yeah like find out the like more natural kind of you know way or like more complex way also of uh, of using it but uh, yeah i think it's beautiful work and uh, like and i also i i'm really I, I'm, i'm impressed by the scale and also like um your way of thinking you know like how to maybe change air into some other liquid material right how to like work in so many level of uh, um yeah like aggregations let's call it also this way so yeah thank you for the presentation yeah thanks um what was i gonna say uh yeah i don't know i guess i guess i you have a very limited time and hook and you want to do so many things and use all the tools and um take everything you've done even further with this in this unique context so i think if i had more time <laughs> um or maybe that just comes from like reflecting on the time there but um yeah certainly like uh addressing this like key um conflict in the project of like taking this uh irregular form and then putting it into a box um which was a kind of driving idea behind the work but um instead of making a bespoke structure you make something that can be implemented uh, which can be put inside a wall construction which you can plaster on uh which you can you know uh curved buildings are difficult to maintain uh is like a as yeah. like an everyday piece of architecture so um but then there's also this kind of uh performative uh aspect of the project uh where i wanted to cut a curve to the thing or uh, there's also an argument for you know working more um precisely with the actual geometry of the tree and there was a lot of waste in the end result um which kind of yeah i don't know there's lots of other avenues to explore with it definitely so but i think uh, you may you may have missed uh i think what was i think one of the most interesting uh structures out in hook park which was the gates uh that Andy Goldworthy uh, had done because in some sense i think some of the challenges that uh, you're speaking to was very much his practice in some ways uh, in terms of using those timbers and uh, trying to find the uh, strategies of how you nest and how you start to structure form i think the only thing that i would suggest is that uh, there's a tendency of trying to uh, loosely use the word product mm -hmm. and architecture and craft and the things that i think resonate in the project i think is the the craft aspect and the creative reuse of something that generally is a byproduct and i think the strength of that is very much there i think you may get disappointed 
and what industrial product actually really means uh, in the world of, you know, I don't know, uh, plywood and all of this other kind of stuff that come from kind of industrialized processes. So I, I think in terms of your research, there's already an incentivization to kind of push on, on basically using this kind of so-called waste wood in creative ways and, and really thinking about a digital craft under new terms. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you to kind of focus on that. And I think Goldsworthy, I think, is a really interesting character because I think you could design a strategy instead of kind of laying out the kind of industrial product that you would pitch to a, an incubator. I would, I would prefer that you would think of it as a kind of on-site strategy for people to look at resources around them and creatively reusing them because it seems like that potentially is also a different way of achieving, I think, what is, I think, a very meaningful goal. But at, at the moment, I think it's good because freeform experimentation gives you that opportunity of self-reflection. But if you get too reflective, then you kind of get lost in the forest and you never come back. So I would suggest that... I left uh, now, so... Well... Don't worry. I, I wasn't so worried. I mean, <laughs> I've read Walden and other places that it's been good for people. But I'm just saying in terms of the way that you think about your work and, and the industry, I think that there are strategies that are latent that you could tease out with Zach and, and with all your colleagues at, at Hook Park. But it's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I could add one final thing. I put a couple of things in the chat, but um, that uh, I, it's very enjoyable, your, your presentation. And there's a lot to be uh, uh, commended. Uh, I think it, uh, another issue which sort of following up from Theo is um, it's never going to, I think, um, be worth all your creative efforts to invent an industrialized product. But there, there is a long tradition and a number, there's always a small percentage of architects who want to work with uh, craft oriented processes to, to design buildings. I think a principal issue uh, for this is that you, you're still occupying, let's say by the preoccupation with the block or with relatively simple forms, uh, a, a kind of pre or early industrial model. So th there's possibility of using a variety of scales if you free yourself a little bit from the crown, occasionally take some uh, larger pieces, because that will give you a potential to explore you know, a much more diverse range of forms to take care of the structure because your bigger elements can you know, transfer and all of that. And that's also in the tradition of uh, what's been already accomplished at Hook. Um, and I think the packing algorithm, I've made some comments on that, but uh, yeah, um, that's solvable, but it's not trivial. Yeah. It's not completely amenable to working on a laptop in a forest. Um, but that, that kind of approach of identifying different scales and different potential forms for design and then exploring from that perspective uh, different kinds of packing uh, would mm. be a very interesting route for you to continue your research. Well, yeah, I think like making making the house that's like uh, created with all the different elements of the tree uh, which you can't use uh, yeah. would be like uh, yeah, if I could do that, that would be great. <laughs> Start at the other end. Start with the design of the house, and then kind of optimize the the flow of uh, materials and uh, irregular objects. Mm. And that's a classic just... evolutionary computational approach. If I could throw in one, which is maybe more just a, a point for discussion later. And thank you, everyone, for such great comments and, and sub for the presentation. I guess for me, one that maybe points a little bit the counter and I guess would say I would think is for me the noble part of Seb's kind of acceptance of the block is for me, it engages an unwillingness to accept architects engaging with 5% of the built environment. It, it operates in that space that I think is difficult and the first version of this block is, is not enough on, but the kind of trusty old box has persisted despite our many fights for years. And so I think that the, the DTB isn't there. Um, but, but I do think there's something interesting in our space of trying to engage explicitly from the opposite of thinking 
maybe that is what will continue. But yeah, I don't know. It, it doesn't, that's not meant to undermine all my time. Well, thanks everyone. A uh, very interesting discussion. It's yeah, it's incredible how actual production leads to so many complex conceptual, uh, historical, and and also contextual problems that we want to talk through. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to continue at the end. Uh, I suggest that we take a few minutes uh, break now uh, and start up again at three thirty, and just run from three thirty to five. Uh, we've got, I think, three more programs to get through and then the full discussion. Does that sound okay? Okay, so we'll be back in four minutes with history and critical thinking.
at this point, Will, I would uh, buy you a coffee if I could. So consider this a virtual coffee offer. <laughs> ah, thanks very much. <laughs> and to anyone else who's uh, joined us, there you go. Wouldn't it be nice to meet at the AA bar again? Absolutely. You can sign me up, Elena. Okay, shall we get started again? We have uh, three more programs, History and Critical Thinking and Architecture, Landscape Urbanism, and Sustainable Environmental Design. Uh, in his last comment, Theo uh, mentioned the careful choice of words. Uh, in our next program, words, uh, concepts have to be considered very carefully indeed. Uh, it's a program very close to my heart. Uh, Marina, take it, take it away. And thank you very much, Will, uh, Mike, uh, Raj, for this wonderful event. It's very nice to see all of you and to be here today and celebrate um, an amazing year of work despite all. Um, yeah, the, um, I'm the head of the History of Critical Thinking, uh, a May degree, it's one year program. Uh, we organize uh, our coursework within the first two terms, for term one and term two, and then uh, um, the students use term three and four to develop and complete their uh, final thesis. Uh, and today, uh, in fact, we'll have uh, two uh, students or two people sharing the limited time we have. Uh, Philip Mesco, who uh, completed and uh, presented his thesis last September, at Siaki Wang, who is still uh, at the initial uh, stages of the thesis. Um, before I, I give uh, the word to them, I would like just to say that uh, history critical thinking uh, is a kind of, is organized and it's being uh, developed as a platform. And here I'll, I'll use uh, uh, the word of Elena platform and building alliances. And in one way to in, to uh, reflect, investigate, explore, and develop uh, ways of thinking, and actually uh, craft ways of speaking and writing. As uh, we'll say, the words are very, uh, we are very precise with words. Uh, writing and talking about um, contemporary issues, concepts, ideas, but from a, a historical cross-disciplinary and critical point of view. And while this uh, critical reflection on history is necessary for us uh, to analyze uh, contemporary ways of thinking and practices, specific histories remain, and as you will see in these two presentations, remain valid sites of investigation the way um, they negotiate sources, perspectives, they appropriate, augment, and exclude voices. And at the end, they shape the way these histories shape our conceptions of uh, the built environment and design practices. So in one, what has been at stake uh, is the writing of history, but as a form of engagement with the social, political, environmental, and um, um, philosophical conditions and demands of, of the present. And uh, the two projects, uh, although they are located in very different historical contexts, uh, Philip's project examines the history of mining and appropriation of earth and representations uh, draw, uh, drawn and visual and graphic representations of Earth in uh, Europe between uh, 15th and 18th century. Uh, Tsiaki looks at these uh, material processes of transformation in the context of the Great Leap Forward in the 1950s and 60s in China. So the contexts are very different, but there are underlying uh, um, shared issues and methodologies. And I'll leave uh, uh, now to I'll leave it to Philip and Siaki to actually to demonstrate that. Thank you. Thanks, Marina. Um, and thank you, Will, and all the rest of you for organizing this event. It, um, 
uh, makes me feel like I'm back at the AA, makes me very happy. As Marina said, I graduated and I graduated now, but I, uh, I finished in September. Um, I will try to share this and I won't see you. So if this does not work, then please tell me so. Uh, all right, you should That's see good. the title screen. Great. So um, my project, as above, so below, uh, is about um, projecting mining in Europe uh, through these 300 years, 1500 to 1800, roughly. Um, and it started out as a kind of investigation, or it started out, it was prompted by my kind of interest in, in issues of climate crisis. And uh, it's kind of um, uh, all this talk about the Green New Deal nowadays, for example, and how uh, that is very much rooted in um, questions of renewables and how renewables um, require a lot of um, underground input, let's say, so minerals, for example, uh, which means that although you can kind of maybe move away from fossil fuels, you cannot really move away from the underground. Um, so this was my attempt to, to kind of tackle that question. But rather than, than um, uh, tr attempting to um, uh, investigate uh, um, the role of mining in architecture, I tried to do the reverse. So I tried to investigate the role of architecture in mining, let's say, which uh, proved to be a much more difficult task. Um, so I will hopefully uh, raise more questions that I answer now. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm at work, uh, so I won't be able to join the joint discussion uh, later. Uh, so if you would like to continue this discussion, you can ask Will or Marina, and I would happily answer any emails. Um, so this is the overall structure of my um, project. The, it has four chapters, an introduction and an epilogue. I will try to very briefly breeze through it. Um, so the first chapter um, was about the mining and measure as it kind of arose over this period, the early modern period, up until let's say the, the French Revolution or thereabouts. Um, and what you see here is the kind of um, evolution of a kind of scientific way of thinking, a scientific epistemology, if you will, um, which is really um, rooted in Descartes and um, Francis Bacon, for example, or the paradigmatic figures of this. And they um, kind of postulate um, a notion of um, space as kind of extension. Extension is the primary quality. Um, of things and all the rest are basically secondary qualities like color. Um, so um, this kind of empty abstract um, extensive notion of, of things, I think goes hand in hand with the same process um, uh, in society. So if, if Dickel and, uh, and Bacon, for example, they apply this kind of notion to nature through science, uh, I think uh, the concomitant um, uh, happening in society is the measure of, of um, money, uh, which is equally abstract, if you will, a kind of purely quantitative way of, of, um, uh, of uh, assessing societal uh, phenomenon. Uh, so I, in this first chapter, which is kind of a, a kind of speculative introduction, theoretical introduction to this work, I tried to draw those connections out. Uh, so the mind is really about measuring um, earth because you cannot see anything down there. Right, so you have to you have to project um, in order to kind of um, yeah uh, in order to appropriate what's um, be beneath the surface, uh, and the second chapter um, begins in the 16th century and is about um, is centered around the figure uh, of Agricola as we know him. His name was Georg, Georg Bauer. He was a, a, a German um, humanist. He was a physician. Uh, and he wrote a, a treatise on mining, which was probably the most influential text on mining in history. Um, it, it set the standard for mining practices over the next 200 years, basically. And in this, um, in this uh, chapter, I tried to draw out the notion um, of a kind of changed world um, in which uh, mining in Europe becomes uh, much more important due to various um, uh, belligerents and financial matters that are both based in, in, in the increasing use of money, both to pay for mercenaries and to pay for their arms, but also kind of metals 
from underground uh, constituting said arms. Um, and um, in this context that he, wor uh, he, he was um, working, so he published his book in 1556, the year after he died. And um, uh, in this context, uh, you can see rapid changes. Uh, one of them is that um, Fortuna, um, the figure of uh, you know, fortune, is changing from a kind of wise, um, um, omnipotent almost, uh, judging woman into an alluring nude, as you can see here, this kind of Botticelli-like um, figure who kind of draws you into this kind of world of mining where you can strike lucky, literally, and become very prosperous and rich and powerful. Um, and Agricola makes use of kind of this, uh, he's spurred by this, and since he is a physician, um, he uses this kind of uh, humanistic uh, physician, um, let's say, uh, sensibilities to investigate what's going on in his home region of southeastern Germany, where all, the, all of this mining is kind of centered at this time. Um, so I, I was looking at uh, representations of uh, the body, how you kind of peel the body to reveal what's underneath, um, uh, which is very similar to the notion of um, investigating the, the earth and the underground. Uh, for example, I mean, it's pretty obvious that, that the word vein um, shares um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, connection between the body and the earth. And the earth is starting to be seen as a body uh, at this time, and more specifically as a kind of female body. Um, uh, and as such, it, it also becomes kind of objectified and um, becomes the object of um, domination and exploitation. Uh, and Francis Bacon in a passage, which is a bit unfair to him, he even talks about the need to kind of uh, rape earth, um, which is kind of horrible. Um, so these images here are from a treatise that um, Agricola wrote, and I, I dove into that extensively to try to figure out what the use of images in this treatise meant and uh, the parallels it had to certain uh, treatises in architecture, pure and simple, uh, during the same time. For example, Sebastiano Ferlio, who was an Italian um, architect who wrote a treatise, which was very famous. It's one of the earliest ones to really make use of images to convey a kind of uh, dimension that wasn't there uh, only in the text. And I think Agricola does the same with his images, which is very interesting. Um, he, he claims that he is uh, trying to make a scientific breakthrough um, by um, basing everything in a treatise on empirical observation. Uh, it's not necessarily true. He deviates quite a lot from that because he's also trying to satisfy his patrons, which are kind of learned humanists, uh, looking for um, sort of universal solutions, which aren't really uh, necessarily applicable in this context where mining is still a kind of um, craft, let's say. Um, and I kind of realized that um, uh, what, what Agricola's illustrations are prefiguring uh, here is a kind of notion of the seriality of work and the subsumption of the worker um, to the machine. And the machine here is not simply the specific machine, uh, as you see in these images, but the, the whole mine as such, which incorporates um, uh, a lot of things outside the mine as well. Um, so at this time, this was a very new notion of presenting um, uh, things in general, but especially work. So the images uh, are really meant to illustrate the text. But equally, the text is meant to illustrate the images. And uh, uh, the descriptions are very meticulous, the, the different kind of movements you have to do in order to be able to work in lockstep with these machines. So I think um, what you see here, uh, the mind becomes a kind of a repository uh, for, um, for a certain new notion of, of uh, work, which I think is rooted in a sort of emerging capitalist um, social relations. Uh, also concomitantly, this has profound uh, effects on the environment. And uh, in all these images, you can kind of see the trees are all dead and the environment is very devastated. And mining was in fact a very uh, destructive practice uh, and rightly so uh, hated by uh, many people. But this is something that starts to change in this period. And I will try to rush through this um, 
The second um, uh, chapter is on, on the depiction of mining in the Encyclopédie, which is almost 200 years later. Um, you can see now the body, uh, the, the skin that's peeled away in Agricola now becomes kind of a tangible body uh, that has depth, it has surface, it has to be cut rather than peeled. Um, uh, uh, strikingly, a lot of the images in the Encyclopédie um, are um, uh, copied from sources that are very, very, very old. So in a sense, it can seem that mining has actually stood still since uh, Agricola's time. Uh, in another sense, you could say that society maybe has caught up uh, to uh, the unified body of knowledge that Agricola was trying to put forward. So here the Agricola's body is finally disintegrated and the pieces are reassembled into uh, kind of universal knowledge. It's grounded on basic principles that are equally valid for every type of knowledge, basically. Just to take one example of the kind of uh, succession of plagiarization of images, this is one from the Encyclopédie. It's based on this one from uh, a couple of decades before, from a, a map by a, a guy called Lotta. And he, in turn, has taken it from an even older um, illustration of a water pump from the 1660s, uh, actually dating back to 1617. Uh, and this might very well be based on Agricola's um, original kind of illustration in his treatise from 1556. Um, but in parallel to this, what uh, goes on in the encyclopedia as well is uh, the kind of development of the underground as a kind of um, mystical space that's not really sacred anymore because it has been desacralized, but uh, you start kind of worshiping a certain notion of industry here. So this is a salt mine in Poland. Um, and in investigating this, I will uh, speed this up. In investigating this, I kind of try to draw parallels uh, between um, uh, these spaces and, for example, what Tefuri is writing about uh, the Carceri of Piranesi, um, which he describes as kind of um, infinite space um, where um, the traditional kind of ordered notion of space is, is shattered. And that this kind of enters. Um, this is trying to enter a new a new paradigm of, of spatiality, uh, which is rooted in, in modernity. And I, I try to kind of look for a different infinity rather than this ex expansive um, three-dimensional infinity uh, that Tafuri finds in Piranesi. I was trying to look at the more linear um, infinity, let's say, of um, the cross-sections of the mines in the Encyclopedia and Pierre Pat's uh, famous cross-section of a street in Paris, this kind of uh, section that you can um, multiply infinitely. Uh, I will go on. Um, the last uh, chapter uh, is looking at uh, mining as kind of, as I call it, a state utopia in, in, in the same time in Germany, um, where um, the state administration is trying to um, uh, remodel itself on the, the model of the mine. So they look at the mine um, and they, they see a model for state uh, administration and state uh, hierarchy, for example. So here the, the state uh, takes from the mine a kind of um, uh, technical, um, and, uh, let's say, uh, how can I put it? The, the state takes from the mine a kind of organizational um, and machinic uh, logic and in turn, I think the mine is actually becoming a kind of uh, administered um, site itself, which it wasn't really before. And a key, uh, a key element in this is the mining map, um, which is starting to be used in the, in the 18th century. So I investigated the mining maps uh, from this period. Uh, they didn't really exist in Agricola's time. Usually you try to avoid making maps because you could uh, cheat pretty easily and you could like sneak your tunnel uh, into others. Um, other tunnels and claim their medals, for example. Uh, so now the state really takes control over this and these portraits, I think, uh, show how important this was. Um, and uh, I will just show some kind of examples of these maps themselves. These are not the most, um, 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 the most uh, amazing, spectacular maps. There are many of them. These are the kind of dullest maps, the more typical examples that I choose to um, uh, show you here. Um, they are very intricate um, combinations of section, plan, and oblique uh, views, and they are living documents. 
um, they are updated uh, sometimes over um, decades. Um, maybe you could call them like proto BIM <laughs> software. Um, and I, I kind of look at these maps as kind of interface um, where uh, the architectural project sort of um, appropriates the, the underground and nature, but also um, kind of maybe the other way around, how, how um, this project, no matter how much you kind of plan it, as you see in this uh, drawing where it kind of goes uh, out of bounds, <laughs> you're always at the mercy of the uh, of nature at the uh, of the veins, for example. And uh, for my last slide, uh, and my last example here, uh, this is the area around outside Freiburg, um, which is a kind of. Uh, it really shows how this kind of uh, rational enterprise somehow loses itself in a very kind of irrational, um, almost mad. Um, uh, incessive exhumation, um, and uh, from that I, I try to draw some kind of speculative conclusions. Um, at the end, in the epilogue, I look at, I, I evoke, I bring in this this notion of mining that has been lurking in the background. Um, uh, so I go back to the kind of uh, the 15th, uh, 16th centuries, and I look at. Uh, the moment when architects, architects and engineers were not so far apart, they were almost the same figure. Um, and I try to uh, explore the, instead of the extractive mind, the explosive mind, the military mind um, that kind of comes to uh, undermine literally um, architecture. Uh, and I try to draw a kind of analogy to uh, our current profession and our current situation as architects. Um, that we might kind of um, do best in sort of expanding our um, scope and try to be a bit more belligerent, let's say. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry for going over. And uh, Jackie, please take it away. Um, thank you, Philip. And let's get back to the ground level. Um, um, so this is still an ongoing thesis. Um, Alchemy of the Earth, Construction Sites in the Great Lake Forward, um, 1958 to 60. So the, the Great Lake Forward was initiated by Chairman Mao in the geopolitical context of the Cold War, featuring the slogan exceeding the UK, surpassing the US, uh, especially in steel production. Uh, and it features also um, countless steel plants and backyard furnaces springing up all over China in, in just a several months or several years. And according to the propaganda at that time, it was an era when one day amounts to 20 years. So it was really the climax of our modern time experience um, when uh, the ideas of temporality, acceleration, transformation were pushed to its extremity. Um, so construction sites are springing up uh, endlessly, successively, constantly, and remaining to be completed in this sense was quite symptomatic of this uh, communist world revolution that shall never end at that time, or uh, in, in Chinese. Uh, so, so it, of course, the, the construction site was a place of transformation, or in Chinese, hua. So, um, of course, it was a place of transformation, but to say it's just a place is still too abstract. Like when you look at it materially, namely looking into this transformation of the earth on site, you actually um, sense it that it kind of this time experience bifurcated into two different ways. First of all, the world, and second of all, the, the soil. Well, first, the, the, this world revolution idea. And you can see from Chairman Mao's poem, after uh, one month after he digging the soil and working on the construction sites, the silver hose fall onto the mountains attached to the heaven, the iron arms shake the rivers on earth. So he was basically talking about the tools and the machines uh, dealing with the soil, transporting the soil. But you could see clearly it was also a project of the, of the globe or even of the cosmos. And um, as to the world revolution part, uh, the German philosopher of history, Reinhard Koslick, has put it quite clearly uh, in his comment to French Revolution or the revolution since then. So Great Leap Forward was a part of it. If Earth is to be revolutionized in its entirety, it necessarily follows that the revolution must last until the time this goal is achieved. So um, 
at that time, the this idea of transformation and this idea of Hua was omnipotent on the construction sites, uh, kind of exemplify a revolutionary uh, experience of time because it could be used as a very flexible suffix to put under many objects and processes on, on site to attune everything into this progressive accelerated uh, time of revolution. As I said, Hua is the revolution. So you can see this vehicle Asian track Asian uh, and this belt Asian or mechanization or automation and everything could be Asian. And you could see that um, people really love to illustrate this Asian process in a section. So they could look like a line, a progressive and accelerated process, uh, or use people's words at the time, it was a dragon or many dragons. But also, when looking to this uh, word Hua, this transformation, you could find a more ancient meaning uh, in Chinese philosophy or uh, Chinese myth early times. That is metamorphosis. You could find it uh, in, in the stories of changing animals. This become this, that become that. There is constant change of the shape. And later into uh, the 19th century when chemistry was introduced to China, it was translated into Hua Xue, which is the study of Hua, the study of transformation. The great leap forward, you could still note that there is a different Hua from the revolutionary experience, which is uh, this metamorphosis that's flexible and instant and sometimes marvelous. And people are really fascinated with this marvelous moment of change, say, uh, be it this uh, related to the combustion in the backyard furnaces or steel plant, or the, um, uh, the, the topographic transformation of the soil on, uh, on the uh, infrastructure uh, construction sites. So there is a poem dedicated to the uh, conveyor belt, a belt that transported uh, the, the soil to the top of the dam, a uh, reservoir dam. In the ocean of the masses, I'm a whale huffing and puffing mountains of pebbles in the galaxy on the land, I'm a dragon turning around and moving all the pebbles to top of the dam. So it was really not quite in, uh, institutionalized into this uh, revolutionary track or this kind of um, dogma of, of time experience. It remained certain openness and specificity and um, it's, or even irrationality, as you may put it, uh, to with, with the environment, with the nature, with the material that people were working with. So, um, and it also uh, for architecture discipline or architects, it also become a prelude to the design revolution that took place during the Cultural Revolution, which is uh, since the mid 60s, which features on-site design. Uh, it means architects were driven to the construction sites and uh, not in the studios and offices anymore and working with the builders. And also it features um, round earth housing for uh, temporary living uh, on the construction sites, which is still a, a continuation of this uh, experience uh, in the Great Leap Forward in the 70s. So, um, but it was not just about architecture, it was about architecture incorporated into a larger project of world revolution, but also dealing with materials at the same time. Um, but ultimately, this research, this ongoing research, will kind of inquire into this uh, problem of politics and built environment, namely revolution and the earth. Because nowadays we are kind of in a post-socialist time. Like when Kozlik wrote in the mid seventies when Cultural Revolution was still going on and he did mention it in his book, he, he said, has not the world revolution been reduced to an empty formula which can be appropriated pra pragmatically by the most diverse groups of countries and flocked to death. So it was really a pessimistic um, tone that revolution has become an empty formula. And at, at the turn of the century, Anna Tsing, uh, the post-humanist anthropologist, wrote that I hardly know how to think about justice without progress. The problem is that progress stopped making sense. So there is a really a turning point. Where we are suddenly from this um, progression story to Anthropocene. To the story of life on earth the problem is that this turn is made too easy and too fast and they, therefore to to searching this possibility of life and capitalist ruins 
become a project that can never be completed because otherwise you're the refugee, you know, seeking seclusion in, at, at the margin of the, this capitalist world. But kind of setting apart or abandoning the agenda of revolution because you do not know what to do with it. And it's just an empty formula based on the previous experiences. So by looking into the ruins of the Great Leap Forward, we could actually, um, talking about the possibility of a revolution that is simultaneously about the world and also about the soil in specificity. That is not an empty formula, but really situated revolution, but not abandoning this agenda itself totally, as Anna Tsin proposed in the mushroom at the end of the world. That's it, a project of um, both the world and the soil. So um, Philip really uh, digged into, digged very deep into this early history of mining, this early history of people's interaction with the earth. And it's a project that kind of envisioning and questioning the future of our relationship with the earth. Thanks. Thanks very much uh, to both of you. Interesting thematic connections there. So we are running uh, behind time fairly seriously, uh, but let's have a question or comment now. I'll refrain from adding to the history and theory uh, verbosity. I just wanted to say hi to Philip. It's so nice to see you. Um, we always used to like bump into each other at the library and, um, you know, through words and books. And I so wish we could share more of that. Anyway, nice to see you and to to um, have you share your work. Um, and both of you, Jackie, thanks for that. Um, I just, you know, what I always appreciate about um, what your program does is that through a rigorous and careful reflection, you unsettle our assumptions about what we think thought we knew about mining, what we thought we knew about soil, what we thought we knew about revolution, transformation. And I think it's this notion of unsettling assumptions, which we need to endeavor to, um, I guess, hold to in however we structure, understand what a project is and does as a, um, uh, as, as a, I guess, a challenge to, to convention and where these unsettled assumptions might take us to next or indeed take us back to. So I think there's to and fro, this back and forth through careful, rigor rigorous um, attention. And if I were to use and paraphrase the friend of Anand Singh, who is Donna Haraway, who comes from a science and technology studies um, um, a background, to stay with the trouble you know, to engage and to stay with the trouble slowly, carefully, and cogently. And so I wanted to thank both of you for reminding us what research means if we are to take it seriously. And I think obviously there are more points to make in terms of the specificity of, of, your, of your research. And I'd love to engage in that discussion because I'm looking at mining, say, from the work of um, what, um, uh, what's her name, uh, uh, Yusuf, um, Oh, um, I've forgotten her name, who wrote A Billion um, Black Anthropocenes um, or None. Catherine Yusuf. Catherine, that's right. I'm sure we probably shared that, that book together in the library at some stage. Um, and what a feminist and indeed decolonial understanding of mining is and the soil does to our unset to unsettling our assumptions about these practices. So, I mean, I could go on and I'd love to. So, yes, by all means, let's, let's have a virtual coffee through another platform. But it's interesting how, in fact, across programs, we are reading similar references, but translating them, I guess, at different scales and with different inferences. And that's why I think these moments are crucial in terms of establishing, establishing convergence, discussion, controversy as well, and maybe to agree to disagree in order to drive further conversations forward. So I look forward to disagreeing with you at some stage, you know, maybe in the future. Likewise. Thank you, Ella.
Okay, shall we continue? I think maybe we can come back to some of the uh, shared research themes and like maybe just the role of discur discursive research uh, and writing in the, in the larger discussion. So let's hand over to landscape urbanism. Hi, hello. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, well, thanks, Willie, uh, for the moderation. And thanks, Rush, for the organization and everyone behind uh, um, this uh, great day and for making it possible. No? It's, it's, it's been an amazing journey to see uh, all the work of the postgraduate students and, and, and obviously not only that, but uh, to learn no? from, from the different uh, research agendas. Uh, so thank you for that and obviously uh, for allowing us to be part of it. Uh, so my name is Alfredo Ramirez. I co-direct uh, the Landscape Urbanism together with Eduardo Rico. And uh, well, just briefly to introduce uh, to everyone, Landscape Urbanism is a program uh, that leads to, uh, either to an MMARC uh, degree or MC, Master in Science degree. And it's a program that has been dedicated the last uh, two years uh, to align itself to uh, what is called a Green New Deal, specifically for uh, UK. So the program uh, uh, aim is to leave the design profession uh, with existing Green New Deal movement. Uh, because we believe that uh, designers, uh, whether you know landscape architects, uh, architects, or urban designers, can use their skills uh, in terms of visualization, mapping, spatial understanding of socio-ecological systems, uh, landscape design, data visualization, among others, uh, to aid the development of spatial strategies that can uh, help to tackle uh, climate breakdown. So uh, many of these strategies. Uh, coalesces into the Green New Deal, which is uh, one of the largest and more ambitious projects to date. And, and that we have selected various policies uh, that have been proposed by uh, Commonwealth, a think tank that we have partnered with, uh, to envision their implementation across UK. So uh, this is the context in which uh, Forest uh, to the End, uh, which is a project that will be presented by Kyushi, Chengaran, and Yufei, uh, is uh, framed. No? So this is a project that uh, considers a forest as a multi-dimensional landscape uh, that integrates the concept of the wood white web and, and can give us a different understanding of the forest from a, a different perspective for a potential green new deal. So uh, uh, it creates reciprocal attitudes no, towards forests and it uses uh, a hook park as a site for uh, the investigation. And it, it, it explores uh, the topic not only as a, as a way to change mentalities no, within the profession, but also uh, to address uh, how land forestry policies can actually be uh, used no, to achieve these changes. So I'm just gonna leave it there and I'll allow then uh, Kushi Chengaran and Yufei to, to present the project to all of you. Hi, uh, our team working on the forest and team members, including Yufei Dong, Chu Xili, and Chen An Luo. We are aiming to break people's stereotype of looking at forest and uh, giving back to the forest. Forest could be considered in a multi-dimensional way with multiple meanings as a forest, and including production, biodiversity, carbon sink, but all of them only emphasize the benefits of human. Will the concept of wood with web give us a clue to understand the forest from the nature dimension? Our project is to find a way of integrating this reciprocal understanding into current forestry policies and grants, as human plays an essential role in forest for the reciprocal accomplishment. Starting from the changing forest metaphor, in terms of the social meanings, in the early stage, Chinese considered themselves as guests of nature. And in 16th century, European treat nature as machine and the influence of God. In the following stage, it came to the recurring domain phase. Between 17th and the 19th century, 
European countries were in Chile to come on the world stage. Here are the current alternatives to the dominant Western discourses. Like in 2018, China proposed the community of the shared future idea and advocate protecting nature on global scale. We also provide alternative metaphors as those relate to our management principles. First is about the indigenous honorable harvest. They treat nature as gifts and suggest harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Tree could be considered as a wise teacher in the 19th century. Well, in the present, nature considered as a part of ourselves. In the latest metaphor, the forest is considered to be a carbon sink. How much carbon does forest secrets for? Commonly used method mainly focused on the above ground carbon use storage, but ignore the carbon sequestrated underground. To better understand the forest as carbon sink in the UK, we use Hope Park as a prototype for carbon measurement. Field work, including get information about um, species, DBH, and density. Then we got the carbon stock in each compartment by inventory method. This carbon metaphor leads to a mentality where trees are considered exchangeable and saleable carbon credit in which only human benefits are emphasized. On a global scale, carbon credit is traded through carbon market between countries. It leads to the commodification of car forest carbon, which results in the monoculture forest obscuring other forest dimensions. But is it all about carbon? What does carbon mean to the forest? Carbon is also a form of communication that builds a reciprocal re relationship between plants. Carbon exchange are commonly known as the phase of breeding and the food transition. Reciprocal connections also happen between neighboring plants. Mother trees as a metaphor meaning of veteran trees pro provide carbon to its seedlings to give them a head start. And the, the seedlings ensure their species have a more dominant role in the ecosystem. And the dying tree will dominate all their nutrients and sugars to their surroundings. Some plants which are unable to do photosynthesis rely on receiving carbon from networks. Well, mycorrhiza can, a mycorrhiza network can exchange not only carbon, but also more resources. Plants under attack can send out warnings to others and the mother tree can help the diseases when getting through. Wood wet web is a scientific way of reciprocity. In fact, this symbolic metaphor has existed for hundreds of years. Our project is about designing a policy assessment grant and menu book that challenges our understanding and the relationship with forests, starting from Hook Park. Before that, we need to know more about the forestry policy developed in the UK and its reflection in Hook Park. After World War II, Hook Park was almost clear failed and served for wood production. With the help of Forestry Commission, it has been re replanted. During this period, policies not only focused on the reforestation, but also started to notice the recreation in the forest. Since 1982, Hook Park has been used as a school, and the policy started mentioning wildlife, biodiversity, and sustainability. Since 2015, a sustainable way of burning biochip mentioned in the guidelines have been used in Hook Park. Also in the UK Woodland Assurance Standard, maintaining the continuity of mother tree habitant is emphasized. Mm, policies can help to shape the woodland and change its relationship with human beings by giving subsidies. The current scheme of woodland management plan is used for creating a 10 year plan to meet the UK forestry standard. The process including survey and analysis, but how much money the forester will get only depends on the area of the woodland. What we want to change is giving subsidies according to the woodland condition assessment and encourage people to take part in activities giving back to the forest. We categorize each item from requesting to giving back and then emphasize the conditions like cultivating fungi as mother tree remain in each item, we also refine the standard of evaluation. Here shows the 
current condition of Hoop Park, then what could we do to improve the results of the assessment? In order to get more grants and improve the forest health, we launch our menu book. We want to look at the forest vertically throughout the whole project with multi-dimensional concerns. It starts from forest life circle. There are some general management actions, including thinning, pruning, and etc. Each of them related to forest values we mentioned above, and the current Hook Park do not use all of them. Based on our wood by web concept, we adjust the actions. The point of it is to choose the least impact tools and care more about giving back to the nature, not to use large scale machines. We found uh, general models to guide the actions. Then we develop our own three wood by the web models, caring more about the end story, mother trees, fungi, and soil. In order to product those actions, we have a tool catalog analyzing how to use a proper tool. In both carbon-related and non-related tools with those models, we found out another catalog of both leaves to see how those trees could change due to the process of management operation. Beach from young one to old will have a different shapes and structure after thinning, coppicing, raising, topping and reduction. The conifer part has a similar pruning process but behaves differently in the vertical. For the soil, we also do the insection control, loosen control. So you uh, apply organic matter to see the subtle change in the soil. We regard some leisure and, and working exercise as part of the reciprocal reciprocity, including tourism, education, work, exercise, relaxing, timber production, and secondary production. When we list those activities, we consider its current stage and possibility happening in Hook Park. Also, we provide timber usage based on, based on its uh, properties. Those activities could classify into taking and giving back. Two examples shows here. Apply our my new book in Hook Park as example, we may conclude six main characteristics or issues of Hook Park. Here are the detailed six sections from the whole Hook Park site. In the current line, we link the present management actions with plots, and the after sections shows our additional suggestions of these zones. Based on the wide web, we including insect control, groundwater control, and so on. We take the old forestry section as example to show the difference. The current mode are pruning, selective thinning, and wildlife control, and let the dead trees decay. The most important in our additional suggestion are preserving mother trees and the plant fungi. We choose three experimental sites in Hook Park to test our management plan. Firstly, we define forest activities according to the accessibility, trees density, and visual aesthetics of each plot. Although the plot may have multiple uses, we choose three of them, tourism, timber production, and pre-seedling. Secondly, we are informed that original Hook Park has three types of operation, clear fall, thinning, and management. Our site should include all of these three operations. Certainly, we related it to our intervention priority map. We prefer to choose those in first two phase, which are urgently in need to be managed. Then we came to our final three sites. Using our new grant assessment, we analyzed those three sets separately, and each of them would have its own improvement direction. NIF, as a wood production area, would focus on the changes in timber usage. Therefore, the timber will be used for furniture or installation making instead of bio chip or absorb more carbon. Here, we have four types of circles to present the carbon sequestration. On the right, there are two charts. One shows the effective of giving back to the forest, 
and the other shows how much we're taking from the forest. If we only consider taking, like singing 70% and doing nothing to give back, after 100 years, the scenario shows there aren't many old trees left, and the age diversity and the number of the connections remain in the low range. After applying the idea of Woodward Web, then we do 50% thinning but remain 10% trees as mother trees. The number of connections and the total amount of carbon will increase. The forest will also be healthier with the use of mycorrhizal products. After these actions, we compare how much we give and take and find out that when the timber protection is needed, we can apply the 30% thinning in NIF. In this way, we can build a reciprocal relationship. In NIF, we first select the mother tree and remain it throughout the thinning phases. The actions and tools shown here are related to our menu book. New seedlings will uh, replace the thin trees so that we could maximize protecting the underground connection. And in these phases, AA master students could use the produce the timber for its project. In 12C, the majority of change will be in tree species as we advocating planting more native trees. 12C is supposed to have a clear fall and replanting both leaves. Compare these two ways, we choose to do the selective thinning to minimize the harm. And here shows how 12C will be replanted from a conifer plot to a boat leaf plot in the next five years. Firstly, we do the selective thinning and planting native boat leaf seedlings. This action will repeat three times to fully change the tree species. And we can see how a student and surrounding residents could do to enjoy the forest and give them back simultaneously. Activities including forest courses, wildlife tracking, and tree identifying, and etc. The particular changes in setting E are in forest dimensions, since more activities could happen here. For the phase one, after judging from the satellite image, we select a possible path and the singing alongside the path preparing for the phase two. Here we provide possible activities, including singing and some other protect actions like soil erosion control, fertilizing, and etc. In phase two, we provide possible actions along the new path after the ground pavement is prepared. The underground connection increased with the help of fungi, and visitors could do jogging and walking dogs here. Phase three is to have a more space and facilities. And here shows where are the three open spaces. And in 13E, more facilities and required activities and a large gatherings could happen here, like camping, barbecue, and installation making. Here shows the comparison of the before and after in each plot. After all these testing plots, we reduced the assessment improvement in the Hoop Park and see how it would link to its neighbor cities and the forest and to bring people back in the forest to build a reciprocal relationship. Then we can apply it to the UK. The changes will take place we are receiving subsidies currently. And and, and then there will be more woodland management interested in our proposal. The new grant assessment encourage planting native species and controlling invasive species. Broad leaves will account for most of the new planting area and the restocking area. We visualized veteran trees density across UK after keeping the veteran trees and maintaining the habitat around them, woodward web connections will become even stronger and biodiversity structure would also be enhanced. Protecting mother trees as well as gazing control by local groups will promote regeneration through woodland. Saplings will grow naturally in the understory and soil man management, like applying organic matter and losing the soil would help to increase the carbon sequestration underground. 
more forest will reach the standard of woodland carbon code and will contribute to the UK reaching the net zero greenhouse gas emissions. As a result, people go on, on this protective actions may not only be done by woodland owners, but also by local people giving, living near the woodland. The growing links between the forest and cities and the forest themselves are showing a better reciprocal relationship between forest and citizens. As a result, people go to the woodland more often and carry out more activities in the woodland, making the woodland a multi-dimensional forest as known as forest. Land. Yeah, thank you. Well, wow, thanks for that incredibly comprehensive project. Let's take a few minutes here for questions. Hook, Park, where is Seb? I, <laughs> he's in there. I mean, I mean, if while we wait for him, I mean, there's a hundred slides that I'd love to occupy most of this conversation talking about. I think the simple one to say is it's quite a shame we haven't been able to have you back, but it's astonishing how much work you've done since being in Hook pre pandemic. Um, the work needs to get in its final form to our forester. So, so I think just to say congratulations on a really meaningful project that, yeah, one of the things we talk about is engaging with Hook itself as the project. Um, you're doing that. So I don't want to dominate, but to say it's incredibly relevant and powerful for the site. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so I guess I think your, your like description of this balance of uh, intervention or management versus, um, you know, like the actual health of the forest and of the ground in the forest um, is kind of, that's kind of like the paradox <laughs> at the center of presenting timber as the solution to lots of environmental, like using timber construction as a solution to environmental yeah. problems <laughs> in the world. Um, but yeah, I guess, what I'm interested in is, is like um, the actual use of the timber. And I guess I'm wondering if you thought um, about how you could integrate the data you've collected with actual, um, you know, construction or manufacturing processes or how, could, how that could be done and what the merits of it could be. Well, we actually build up uh a reciprocal relationship between forest and, and like a forest and nature to humans. So we try to avoid to uh, treat a forest in um, to minimize the, the harm to the forest. So we want to pre, pre, uh, preserve the mother tree to plant more fungi. These all the uh, actions to uh, protect the forest. And we also advocate to do more um, activities in the forest, like, uh, um, like here, uh, like in the page 52, the actions classified into uh, taking and giving back. Obviously we want more uh, we want people to do more to giving it back, like um, uh, soil erosion control, uh, diseases control, like a uh, uh, mm. pruning, thinning, and something like that. Yeah, we only went to Hoop Park once, and uh, because of the pandemic. And maybe if we have the chance to talk more to the Zach or um, some people in the Hoop Park, maybe we can you know, generate more uh, content about how can we use the timber. 
I wanted to just um, thank you and, um, you know, for, for the rigor, for the commitment and um, like for the depth of um, engagement that you've displayed through this, um, through this project. But also to thank uh, the program for, um, again, revealing to us other dimensions of what we call spatial practice and what design intelligence might bring to various conversations that are happening um, in various conditions that we're having to face now. Um, I'm not going to mention climate change or COVID or whatever it is, but, you know, those kind of matters of concern that the tour would, would call to our attention. And I guess this notion of design intelligence showing us that projects at times are not necessarily physical, but they might require policy dimensions, um, which you refer to in terms of forestry as a multi-dimensional project of engagement. And I think that's quite an important thing to take forward with us in terms of understanding mm -hmm. that our agency is manifold, it's multi-dimensional, and you, know, you are in an incredible um, kind of vanguard as a generation that can take yourselves into various forms of practice. And you know, we really look forward to seeing you know, the challenges that you bring back to us and to shape other forms of practice. I think the one thing I would say is in terms of the challenging aspect of your project is if this is what we can do to um, a woodland, a so-called forest, then how can we bring this, this way of engagement to bear on the issue of plantations, which we face? The mono-dimensional, monocultural aspect of uh, of uh, of um, plantation-based um, forestry product uh, forestry, and and whether there is a way of transferring some of this knowledge into that massive pro uh, problem that that we do face. And I'm thinking specifically in China in terms of what Alipay is doing with the Ant Farm uh, yeah. project. So I mean, there's a scalar jump, and you know, do some of these practices translate? Um, you know, when you when you take it to the next scale and, and what gets left behind and what do you give and take? So I think those are, for me, quite interesting um, controversies or challenges that all these projects bring to the conversation. What happens when you scale up or scale down? What gets left behind? But hopefully design intelligence then reveals other opportunities for us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great, so let's move on to our last program, Sustainable Environmental Design. I'll hand over to Simos and Paula. Hi everyone, I'm Simos, Director of the um, Sustainable Environmental Design Program. Long day. I, 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 I don't mean it so much in terms of duration because we've done much longer in duration, but in stuff, so much stuff. Anyhow, um, I'll be very brief. Uh, SED is a research-led, practice-oriented, evidence-based top program. We're organized as a 12-month MSc and 16-month MRC. Uh, we delve into real-life projects that span a broad range of climates, building types, and urban morphologies, targeting carbon neutral futures, as well as in habitant comfort, health, and well-being. So, some of you may have attended our um, Where Are You Now symposia that took place over the last three weeks. These brought back 13 of our recent alumni from around the world, tracing their professional uh, journeys since graduation from the AA and reflecting on the present and future of environmental design and architecture. If interested, these events were recorded and can now be viewed on the AA uh, YouTube channel. Uh, today, our exemplary project is by Anna Dwyer who graduates from SED uh, this week, uh, having uh, completed the MRC um, <clears throat> earlier this academic year. And the topic is suburban regeneration. And I think 
Anna's project offers a very good overview and illustration of the approach, methods, and uh, outcomes of SEB. Thank you, Anna. All right, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, yeah. Okay, great. So my project is called Sustainably Regenerating Levittown, a retrofit of the prototypical American suburb. So I'll start with kind of some of the background and a brief overview of my research. So at the end of the Second World War, there was a massive housing boom that kind of marked a turning point in American suburbanization. Um, millions of people moved to mass housing developments on the outskirts of American cities and the nation became a country of primarily suburban dwellers. Levittown pictured here was one of the first developments to really kick off this era of unsustainable sprawling housing communities. And today houses of this era still make up a significant portion of the current US housing stock. And unfortunately, there are many sustainability issues inherent, not just to the design of the houses, but also to the master planning of um, their communities. And all of this makes them kind of long overdue for a retrofit. So when these suburbs were built, they were intended for basically the, the white middle class nuclear family without necessarily being flexible to other types of family arrangements. Today, the population of US suburbs is rapidly growing, aging, and diversifying. Nuclear families make up less than 20% of households nationwide. And all of this indicates a pressing need, not just for more housing options, but also for more diverse housing options. In terms of climate, it's located in the American Northeast. Um, heating is the main concern with average daily temperatures dropping below zero in January. At the same time, relatively high solar radiation values indicate good potential for passive solar heating. The average annual uh, temperature is predicted to rise by nearly four degrees by 2080 under the A2 most extreme future climate scenario. And that indicates that overheating will become more of a concern in the future. And then lastly, the study of a house of the same era and climate um, provided insight into the materials and performance of existing houses at Levittown. Um, and this study provided the, the groundwork for, for base case analytic work to follow. So the goal of the design is to reimagine a more sustainable and inclusive future for American suburbs using Levittown, New York as a prototype for redevelopment. It'll require a multi-scalar approach looking from the scale of the house all the way up to the scale of the neighborhood. And the idea is that just as Levittown became the prototype for suburban development across the country in the early 50s, so could its regeneration become a model for retrofitting suburbs today. So beginning with the house, the idea is that there should not be a, a single solution, but rather there should be a framework for densification over time, a framework that would allow for some flexibility where central areas could develop to higher density levels than maybe others. And then also different recommendations could be made based on both orientation and then also occupancy. So this is the typical Levittown house. It's a four bedroom, one bathroom house located on a 60 by 100 foot lot. It's lightweight wood frame construction and built on uninsulated concrete slabs. And this housing model, the, the Cape Cod model makes up the kind of vast majority of, of houses at Levittown, New York. Base case simulation results revealed an annual heating load of roughly 188 kilowatt hours per meter squared with a pretty significant heating period stretching from the end of October all the way through May. And without any heating, there are only about four months in the year when indoor temperatures are predicted to reach the, the comfort zone. 
generally there's not a significant risk of overheating even in the summer. So the first phase of the project is, is refurbishment. So existing houses are refurbished through combinations of both material upgrades and also passive solar design strategies. So this version still only caters to larger families with an expanded second floor, which could potentially provide um, an opportunity for multi-generational living. So when looking into the refurbishment, I, I began by looking at modern building codes and trying to understand how these buildings would perform if the construction was upgraded to comply with current New York State standards, ASHRAE standards, and then also ENERFIT criteria. Um, and ultimately, I found that upgrading to ENERFIT targets, which is the, the passive house equivalent for refurbished homes, was about twice as effective at reducing the annual heating load as simply um, upgrading to New York state standards. Um, and then additional energy saving measures such as night shutters, increased south glazing, or a south facing sun space could bring that down um, even farther. Um, so this summarizes the results of my dynamic thermal simulations in, in a bit more detail. So this focuses on the refurbishment of a south facing building. So I upgraded the U values of the building components mainly by keeping the existing structure where possible and then adding additional insulation. And this brought down the heating load to only about 24 kilowatt hours per meter squared, which met the inner fit target of 25. And then the combination of these additional energy saving measures, measures could potentially bring the heating, lo heating load down even farther to only about uh, 12 kilowatt hours per meter squared, with the greatest percentage of that reduction being attributed to that south facing um, occupiable sun space. These graphs consider all of the fundamental refurbishment proposals. So you can see how um, it's both reduced the heating period, but also resulted in some potential overheating issues um, in the summer where outdoor temperatures exceed the upper threshold of thermal comfort. Um, but it happens pretty infrequently as to not be a you know, significant issue. Um, However, when you look at it in the context of, of future climate change, it, it's different. It becomes much more of an issue. So this graph compares the performance of the refurbished house using recent climate data represented by these dotted lines and the climate data for 20 and the performance um, under climate data for 2080 under the A2 climate change scenario represented by the solid lines. So the design is already optimized to provide opportunities for cross ventilation. Um, the main issue is on days when outdoor temperatures exceed that upper threshold of comfort. Um, and with an average annual temperature rise of almost four degrees, those overheating hours rise from only about 6% to almost 20%, which is you know, no small issue. I did find this could be controlled. So this is a week from the hottest month in August where I was able to keep indoor, comp indoor temperatures within the comfort range by simulating the use of nighttime ventilation and also exterior solar shading. Um, and the combination of these two um, adaptive measures is over the whole year, able to keep those overheating hours under control. So next I just have some visualization. So this is the exterior of that south facing refurbished home with that sun space add on. And so while my simulation results have shown that that having the sun space can reduce the annual heating load while also providing um, additional comfortable unconditioned space, there is a real risk of overheating in the sun space on days when solar radiation levels are very high. So providing these adjustable wood screens on the <clears throat> sorry exterior can control overheating in that space by allowing them to kind of open up and allow in the solar gains when they're beneficial, but then also you know being able to slide them shut to limit them um, when they're not. And then during the warmer months, that sun space can act as an extension of the interior living space while then also providing a more agreeable environment for growing plants um, for the rest of the year. 
On the floor above, that sun space can also provide privacy for the street facing bedrooms, which becomes even more beneficial in areas that, that are designed to become more dense. On the north side of the building, glazing is more limited and the more eating, even lighting provides um, a, a good environment for, in this case, a, a home office. So the next phase would be densification. And the idea is that because each lot repeats and is identical, a modular addition can be developed to slide into the residual space on the existing lots. Um, it's important to minimize overshadowing during the heating period when these buildings can take advantage of the high solar radiation values. So these studies essentially show that different massing options might be better suited to different orientations. So in addition, far enough in front, which can evolve then into a form of terraced housing, um, might be built better for buildings in a south orientation, whereas a linear insertion that can kind of stick out and make use of those solar gains coming from the south um, might be better for buildings facing east or west. This shows those phases of densification in plan. So again, the modular building additions work with the repeating lot sizes. And as density grows, those buildings can then be broken apart into multiple units. So here, a secondary street facing structure is added, which can become a live work unit or a flex space for a home office or workshop. Here, that um, addition becomes a two bedroom apartment with, again, that street facing flex space. It could be a garage or some type of office. And then as density grows, those buildings are broken apart into multiple units, including um, ground floor, fully accessible apartments for, for senior living. And then again, those street facing uh, spaces can become retail or communal co-working spaces. The form is such that it would not block solar access even with the lowest winter sun. So the roofs are shaped to the ideal solar panel angle. Rather than creating an attic, um, I've added occupiable outdoor spaces with retractable shading on the north side of the building to provide comfortable outdoor space in the summer. And then that uh, expanded stairwell with ventilative openings at, at the top also has the potential to act as a, a passive stack. So in terms of uh, thermal performance, um, I was more interested in the east-west additions because I, I knew that um, the south facing additions could very easily be be built um, to, to passive house standards. I was more interested in, in these as they're somewhat you know over overshadowed and, and exposed. So I tested a few standards of construction and ultimately I found that insulating to a slightly lower standard might be preferable given the risk of overheating and especially given the context of future climate change. Um, in this scenario, I also found that adding a sun space um, slightly increased the heating load, um, likely because it's partially overshadowed and because the new construction is less likely to benefit because it's already built to such a high standard. And then finally, a comparison of the existing in orange, the refurbished in red, and the new construction. So in terms of heating load, the refurbished home is able to meet NRFIT targets of 25 kilowatt hours uh, per meter squared a year, and the new construction is able to meet the passive house target of 15. So moving on to the level of the street. So I was thinking about a new way of, of thinking of um, front and backyards and in a way that can reduce a lot size and then also free up space for public use. So the front yard typically acts as the buffer between the private house and the public street and it's able to fulfill that function as that street facing sun space. The private backyard becomes the truly private and protected central courtyard. This frees up space behind the house, which can be used for any number of public functions. I'll, I'll go over in a minute. And then in terms of the public street space, the road is narrowed to its minimum width and made far more cyclist and pedestrian friendly. And my argument is that even though overall private outdoor space is reduced, the space that remains is diversified, providing a, a variety of more comfortable options throughout the year from the shaded roof terraces to the sunnier courtyards to the enclosed sun spaces. 
So this is the existing street with the repeating lots. The first level of development would exist on the kind of the peripheries of the town. So again, lot sizes are reduced across the board. Housing is refurbished, but largely unchanged because I believe that the typology will always be relevant and especially to larger families. The reclaimed backyards are reclaimed by nature, include encouraging plant and animal biodiversity, as well as reducing the expanses of environmentally unfriendly lawns. <clears throat> and along the street, I've introduced the dedicated bicycle lanes, along with sidewalks that are protected from the street with wide planting strips. Um, electric charging stations are installed on the driveways and the narrower roads and speed bumps reduce traffic speed. So in the middle zone, houses are both refurbished and then also given additions, either becoming larger multi-generational houses or broken apart into two to three apartments. Part of that addition is that flexible street facing space, which can act as a garage, a studio, workshop, home office, or any other program. Um, existing private backyards are released for public services, such as um, community gardens, allotment gardens, local food production and that street space still provides space for planting strips, bicycle lanes, and sidewalks. And then lastly, the highest level of density, which could take over the new mini town centers. So here again, I'm showing similar street strategies. The housing has evolved into what could be terraced housing broken apart into multiple apartments, including senior friendly units. And then due to the higher density and the reduction of private outdoor space, I've turned those reclaimed backyards into, into public parks. And then lastly, looking at the scale of the neighborhood, these are the town limits of, of Levittown, New York. So currently all commercial properties and businesses are located along a single commercial strip. And this being a you know primarily a commuter town, the offices are located even you know, beyond the limits of, of this page. And so the idea is to create new mini town centers um, that would introduce the kinds of programs that are currently very isolated so that one could fulfill the tasks of daily light life within a 20 to 30 minute walk. Each new mini town is centered on an existing school as these are all already roughly 30 minutes walking distance apart. And within this half mile diameter area, you have about 500 homes. And at the average annual heating load I found in my simulation, that means that this, this individual site alone has a predicted annual heating load of almost 11 million kilowatt hours a year. So assuming that all houses are refurbished, again, to the level that I, I've been testing, the total annual heating load could be reduced um, to about 1,600,000 kilowatt hours a year, which is equivalent to a reduction of nearly 2, milli 2 million kilograms of CO2. And then furthermore, I found that if you cover each south facing roof and solar panels, this site could generate about three and a half million kilowatt hours a year, which exceeds the total predicted heating load for the site. And then this also illustrates um, these kind of levels of housing densification. So a significant portion of that housing would remain single family detached units as there'll always be a demand for that in, in American suburbs. Um, however, this de densification also introduces these multifamily housing options. It provides options for people that would otherwise be unable to live in these communities. And I think that it would also ultimately benefit the people that are already there uh, one, it provides greater justification and would better sustain the introduction of these new programs, the grocery stores, the nurseries, the pharmacies, within walking distance of the existing homes. And then I would also say that the re redevelopment of the public space would be a significant contribution, whereas before you really only had these kind of isolated parks. You now have the pedestrian and cyclist friendly streets, the allotment gardens, the new kind of green routes that could you know run through the entire town it provides a much more diverse system of open space and far more opportunities for for fostering a sense of of community and and neighborhood um so yeah that's it all right thank you thank you for for having me thanks another impressively comprehensive uh project so 
We have, uh, we were originally intended to end at five, uh, but we can run over to 5.30, I think, uh, and carry our general discussion to then. So maybe we can begin with questions about Anna's project and then try to open to the larger discussion through those questions, uh, if that's possible. I have a, a starting point maybe, which is, and I think this is something shared uh, amongst a number of programs. I was impressed with the uh, consistent use of modeling and different kinds of technical approaches to problem solving uh, throughout, throughout the afternoon. Um, and there was, uh, the bulk of your presentation was devoted to the technical exploration of fitness according to certain criteria uh, and, in, and in, the, in, the, in the appropriate context. But you also begin with a, a site choice and you begin with certain uh, position on the typology, which you also mentioned later on, that it's a relevant typology. It has some sort of permanence. Um, how, when you, when you approach a project like this, which is so technical and has the scientific approach that Simos mentioned, how do you understand your own choice? Like, how do you read your own stakes into the project? Or at what point do you feel the kind of boundary between uh, the values and stakes you feel in the project and your technical approach? That's a really interesting question. I mean, I think that the way that I tried to to approach the project was an exercise in, in problem solving. And so my first goal to, was really to kind of understand the problem itself. You know, what's, what's wrong with these suburbs? How can they be improved? And that involved, I think, a, a good amount of research and in, research into the the history of Levittown and to the, the demographics, you know, beyond just the maybe the, the more technical and the climatic side of it. And then as, as I kind of, you know, moved into, you know, from what is the kind of overall problem? Well, then how do I, you know, solve the performance of the existing home? Well, first I have to understand, you know, how do they perform currently? And that involved a certain amount of, you know, placing data loggers and running simulations and then kind of Kind of step by step from then on, I think it was always kind of, it was really focused around how do I solve the problem and I can either solve it through, you know, kind of overall kind of general conceptual ideas or through specifically, you know, um, results that I got from the, the simulations. Thanks, yeah, coming from a, coming from a history and theory background, um, I learned this kind of critical approach, which would avoid, you know, problem, sol problem solving almost at any level, right? Uh, but I really appreciate uh, being here today and seeing all the work, because I think, I mean, and even in my own history and theory research, architecture's role in solving problems, I think, is fundamental. So I think the, the, the intersection of the critical judgment uh, and how one understands and places stakes in architecture and urban and other associated contexts, but then also how to actually move from stakes to solutions. Uh, that's for me the most interesting problem in the history of architecture uh, and also a really interesting theme across all the presentations today. Yeah, um, before I go on with the general and sort of uh, engage with you, Will, on that, I wanted to say um, to Anna, it's a very good presentation. Thank uh, you. A lot of complex uh, analysis and simulation in there, which you presented really well. Um, the choice of Lower Town is also might resonate with other programs um, because it quite famously features in a lot of um, cri critical um, uh, evaluations of. American housing and suburbs in particular. And I thought you were really good the way you positioned yourself about there's always going to be an American suburb. Um, also quite brave in the sense that you're, uh, I mean, I can almost hear the Trumpian arguments that, uh, you know, you're taking away my backyard or my front and, um, you know, it's going to cost a lot more than you would save. And I think that's one of the kind of crucial issues that 
not many people have tried to tackle and the architects particularly aren't very good at that. What, what is the environmental cost of not doing it? And we tend to frame that in terms of um, data that we have access to, but is not particularly convincing to, to the public. Um, so, you know, if, if you live in Levitt Town, you don't really care if the UK is going to drown. Uh, if you live in the UK, you don't really care if, you know, that, that you're in historical drought in California. Um, so somehow between the programs, but particularly on kind of, let's say, on one periphery of SED, is something that I think Stern tried to do in, in trying to make out an accounting basis of how you relate um, uh, climate change parameters like you're dealing with of, of, of CO2, uh, uh, savings uh, to, to the general cost um, of construction and stuff. And we seem to do it the wrong way, wrong way around. We talk about embodied, embodied uh, costs in the material, uh, but we don't cost the uh, effect of not doing anything. Uh, so I, I think your project is very, very well side. I hope you continue with that kind of work, but I hope you, you talk well and you're able to marshal your arguments. I hope you tackle political people. <laughs> Thank you. So, Will, can I come back to you on that point about the model? What counts as a model? Okay, so maybe that's the <laughs> starting point of, you know, between um, different position, what counts as a model? So, for some of us, a model is not a representation of a thing, uh, but it but is a process. And we, we try to model, uh, well, famously climate, but we use our simulations as what-ifs. And we're also prone to getting locked into, oh, well, I've proved it because my simulation says so. Um, yeah, I can see Anna smiling. And I can't see other faces, but every, everyone's fallen into that trap, including me, that modeling is important, but it's, it's always uh, less, in some sense, it's always less than the real thing and prone to error for how you construct the model and what you put in. Um, I think in when I was a student in other ways of thinking about architecture, a model was represented either a material quality or a spatial quality or a spatial organization. Um, I don't know quite how you use the word model in critical theory, so maybe you would kind of talk about that. Yeah, I mean, model model is not used very much in uh, history and theory, uh, apart from uh, reading and partially understanding LM did use concept of model, uh, or maybe some of the theory around ty type. Um, model's not a huge concept. Um, what, 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 what is history, if not a model? Since, since we don't have a one-to-one -one accurate sort of experience of it, what we have, anything that any historian does is a model. So there you are, you're into models as well. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, strong, that's a strong argument. I think the... Yeah, and I actually think that's a really good way of posing the problem to history as a critical practice um, because it questions how the model is constructed and what its ends ultimately are. I think of history, I mean, uh, I try to, very much like a design project working on history, I try to begin with a characterization, say if I'm writing a, a text, uh, I try to begin with a characterization of the contemporary stakes and context for the history. So the, this is a theme from Kosalek that I think is a big part of uh, Marina's teaching 
in HCT. It was a big part uh, when I when I joined the seminars while I was in the PhD program. So constructing uh, stakes or maybe even constructing it as contemporary precedes the historical model and has a complex interaction in how you understand uh, like the genesis of the contemporary moment. There is no uh, one single model of anything. There are multiple models. And in fact, in SED, we, we progress in the range of complexity of the model. I mean, as um, uh, Mike was implying, that certain assumptions are made, certain data are inputs, but it could be a simplified model or less simplified or less simplified or more complexified, etc. cetera. Um, each time, of course, uh, that you add complexity, you're also adding uncertainty and risk. And, and so there's judgment to be made. Um, I have another point for you, which is about research. And uh, um, I mean, in, in our field, research by definition is utilitarian. There is a problem to be solved. There, there, there is something to be gained. There is something to be saved. It's always seen in this way, which, which can be, which, which can make the whole issue simpler in a way and, and easier conceptually. And uh, I remember an instance when uh, I, in a PhD meeting, I, I, I dare to say that to some colleagues who did not believe that research needs to be utilitarian in any sort of way, for God's sake. I mean, it's an intellectual thing. You know, you gain intellectually, that is the end, which is correct, of course. And, and, and so there you can see a polarity be, between accounts, one of which see it obvious that it should be so, and the other see it as obvious that it should be exactly the opposite. And, and, and they're both equally valid and equally... I agree with you at all. Sorry? I'm not sure I agree with you at all on that. Um, because I think any kind of inquiry, uh, there's no... You, if you don't have an aim for an inquiry, you're just doing general reading or, or fooling about. I mean, if you, you think of... Um, there's always a, even if the problem is a gap in knowledge, there's always some aim. And, and, um, or in, if we take worst case, wanting to re reconstitute our understanding of certain historical. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. It's the my perception of colleagues, you know, who who ha who who see it in in the other way. Yeah. I'm not sure there is as much difference as we like to think. That I, I think there are big differences of vocabulary and um, what appear to be differences of technique. But on, on at least the conversations today showed um, the you know. And if I take sorry, we'll keep taking you as an example. But you know, he, he you know states the current situation uh, and presumably the necessity for examining certain uh, events or writings or, or so forth. And that, that's exactly what uh, all of the projects in the you know, design postgrad programs do. Um, well, so to, take, to take Philip's uh, example, he, he had to leave, unfortunately, but since he's not here, I can characterize it for him. <laughs> uh, his, the way he presented it was to begin with uh, the unsustainability of mining. Um, and so he, he presented a contemporary stake, which made an appeal to interests, utilitarian interests. And from there, he expands into a history. Uh, and then to critically judge his history, you have to think about what, how his, uh, the model of history he constructed actually relates to the stakes and to the contemporary situation and interest premises with which, with which he began. So I, I mean, I think I, I agree with you and with Simos about the utilitarian ends ultimately. Um, I mean, we, we, it's a pejorative word nowadays, isn't it? Utilitarian. <laughs> I mean, we tend to think of it as a- It's, it's the oh, first oh, word that came to mind. Where you dump all the instruments you don't use anymore. Yeah, so the Maybe. Um, 
I'm going to sort of just jump in because I'm sure we could take, you know, the model and, um, you know, spend another three hours on that as, as a topical theme. But I'm first of all, I'm going to thank all the students that are still here and um, also for the organizers of this event before I have to leave it at 5.30. So apologies if I disappear. Um, and really it has been an impressive amount of work, which has obviously um, enabled us to write many copious notes about many multiple questions we'd like to um, raise, which I'm sure we'll take these back and kind of, you know, um, refer to them in our own work as we move ideas forward. But seeing as most of the program heads are here, what I'd like to ask all of you is, you know, what is the status of some of these projects? Um, I call them projects, propositions, whatever lexicon we want to use in terms of um, referring to the students' work as presented today. Do you think that they are reflections of um, a kind of status quo in each of the in each of the programs, or have they been seminal and exemplary in driving new agendas, in opening up new seams of or new lines of flight or investigation? Because I think it would be interesting to calibrate them in those terms, in terms of also how do the programs determine a thematic trajectory and what motivates a shift or transition or indeed response to what might be a matter of concern or urgency or whatever we want to call it in terms of a current condition. How are we framing our future um, trajectories of research and endeavor, whether they use models, whether they, whatever methodology they use? Elena, it's nice that you're trying to construct a, a big picture uh, with all of this. But I think in, in, in principle, I think they communicate a form of resilience because there's been a kind of shared experience that a lot of this work has been kind of born out of, which I think is in some sense quite optimistic, uh, quite realistic, and at sometimes also quite paradoxical in terms of the challenges that are ahead. So I, I, I'm, I wouldn't say that the projects in some sense uh, highlight a moment of change in terms of like literally the work that the students developed, but in terms of the ways that they were explored and within a context of a world that will not return to normal, uh, not by design, but by something that is much more motivated as a kind of collective purpose, I think they do start to speak as a kind of benchmark uh, that I think all of us as educators will have to kind of assess. I don't think that that's very far from the conversation of model, because I think that there is a distinction between a model of something and a model for something, and it speaks to agency. A model of something is to describe the world as it is. A model for something is to describe something as an active engagement and participant in it. And I'd like to see the work that we saw today as a model for something. And then the question that would follow up from that would be the nature of practice. And I think that that was something that you asked in terms of some of the student projects. And I think it's important to kind of uh, consider what the nature of praxis is across the board, not just between education and let's say what people do afterwards, like jobs, but really like what's motivating a kind of statement of purpose. I mean, architecture has uh, another crisis in its own right. And I think a lot of the students are trying to do good things, but sometimes good people do bad things as well. So I think to create a kind of critical self-evaluation and a community that that can be kind of shared and critically engaged in, I think is probably what's probably much more important these days. And I think one way to address that is basically for students also to situate their work. Uh, history has a lot to teach us because we continuously repeat it. Uh, it's not to be liberated from it, but it's a constructed thing itself. So we know that there are multiple histories and there, there are multiple kinds of agencies at stake. So I think at the moment for, for all the students is really to kind of keep that well-motivated and sometimes naive optimism that we all love in terms of thinking that ideas matter and have agency and find a way to uh, formulate a practice that has some engagement. And with that, I think will come audiences. And then I, with that, I think potentially these projects themselves become really moments of seeing sustained engagement in something.
which to be honest with you, at the moment, there are a lot of people talking about things and very few doing them. And if there should be some kind of mandate for the school, like a school like the AA is, uh, to really introduce risk in everything that we do, because without failure, without experimentation, there really is no progress. And so I think that that's the only thing that I could suggest is something that should really be reinvested in the school and with work and discussions and forums like this is to actually see where failure resides and where we can kind of push it, fail again, fail better, as, as the way the statement goes, basically. But I think the, the notion of practice would be really important to talk about. Yeah, I, I really want to pick up right there as well. I mean, um, the model is actually a good example, the kind of representative model or the applied model. And I think everything we saw today was applied. Um, for our course, it, it was a very interesting, very successful year with seven outstanding projects, which are all completely different and really explore all very new territories as well. And the expectation for an applied performance project would be that in this situation you would suffer and you couldn't do anything but it was quite the opposite we had applied projects across the world of a scale uh, we haven't seen from students before in that thing and in, in an intensity which tested new ter territories where they really can answer because of the standing networks across the world and because of the knowledge of how to build these networks as well to very individual situations and not just a kind of one fits all kind of solution. And I think that was something I could see very much with our students, but I could see today with these presentations as well, that we're not just trying to go back to what was there before, but actually answering in a situation which is evolving with uh, applied methods and applied uh, models that can start delivering these answers. And I think that is for, for uh, and I could see a lot in across the graduate school now, and I think that's very promising for all of us. Um, yeah. So, I, I I think one of the things that's interesting uh, uh, looking across the uh, the set of projects today uh, touches on this idea of model again, perhaps in a different sense. Is how how do they all manage the question of uncertainty? And um, you know, one way of of approaching that is to, to model processes um, and to try to clarify and, and limit the, the parameters that with which one works. Another is to, to try to understand um, the, the challenge of synthesis when in fact, as we look forward, we're always engaging with, um, with processes that are partial and provisional. Uh, so I, I think, Theo, um, you mentioned something I thought was quite important, you know, looking for ways in which the, the project drives a sense of agency. And I, I think that the, this is something I, I felt we saw a lot of different versions of, of how um, agency is conceptualized as part of a, a, a uh, a process that begins to take form. And I think one of the things that all of us uh, were looking at is the role of, of form in helping us understand agency in relation to uncertainty. And I, I, I like that, um, that set of ideas. I think it would be nice to um, if, you know, perhaps have a longer conversation about the different ways, different programs look at questions of uncertainty um, um, uh, as at the start of the year, perhaps. Um, may I also say something, maybe just from the student side, I also wanted to just uh, second Theo's point. Um, for me, this event would have been super amazing to have within the first one or two weeks of my studies when I entered the AA, actually. It's, it's uh, quite weird to have it at the end, to be honest. Um, still enjoyable, but um, I think that radicalizing a model also, because, like a model becomes more radical in the moment that you're actually confronted with the work of others. No, it's like me disagreeing with someone from DRL or going to a performance of, um, of, of, of Theo students and suddenly like I can either agree or disagree on it. And that makes, I think, uh, more groundbreaking work possible if that's the main goal. 
Um, and I just think like this should happen way earlier. It would be uh, pretty cool. Let's see if we can do that. Yeah, yeah the more the more opportunities, probably the better. Beginning of the year, end of the year. I don't think we've constructed enough of them. Yeah. I have a question that had been entered in the chat from earlier. I just want to make sure I kind of sneak it in here. Um, it's a question from Ishani uh, for the housing and urbanism group. Question is, what kind of urban analysis contributed towards the form and functionality of these very projects as every design is supported by the external factors too? We'll be glad to see these analytical factors. Yeah, I, I, I don't know whether Tao or Caro are still here. Um, I, I think our students who are in China are probably off uh, already. But, um, um, you know, perhaps as an introduction, and Caro, if you want to jump in and reply to that, um, um, I think that one of the things that we do is to try to lead with proposition rather than lead with analysis. So uh, we, we take the point of view that the, the starting point of analysis would be to sort of begin the syllogism that says, if this, then what? Uh, now, so that, that sort of propositional or forward-looking um, uh, perspective is what, in, in our minds, leads to an analysis. So now that, as we kind of said in opening up, for, for us, there are, there are three different possible starting points for urbanism. And it has to do with the idea that a project is related to um, how an urban area might transform. So it's the urban area is both something that is spatial and conceptual on the one hand that is understood as something dynamic. So uh, I, I know that, that the question is kind of relating to this, you know, so what's going on in the city that one should be asking questions about? And um, I think that this calls forth this other idea that we always put at the starting point as well, that there are drivers of change. Now, when we look across the, the, the projects we've seen today, sometimes those drivers of change have to do with a, a new ecology of, um, of forestry, or they might have to do with a changing sense of, uh, of the domestic, or they might have to do with a, um, a changing threat of flooding. Um, now, all of these things and many, many more would be drivers of change, but you, you kind of have to put forward a proposition. What are we talking about? You know, are we talking about a changing attitude about um, the, the way in which companies come together and perhaps lead us to think differently about a stationary, which was Yuzhou's kind of starting idea. And, and does that allow us to think of peripheral environments or formerly peripheral environments as having a new and untapped potential? So the question leads the analysis, as it were. Um, and so the uh, coming back to this point that I was making about uncertainty, uh, yes, absolutely. There are a million things to analyze. Uh, and we're always looking for, I think, as, as Theo was saying, a model that helps us understand what the agency might be that would enable us to address some of those uncertainties collaboratively um, and always by, in a way, redesigning things that we have uh, inherited, found within the city and then modifying them. Uh, yeah, adding on to that, um, I think a big part of the program, or at least for me, it was deconstructing this idea that we can just we can analyze all the factors and understand the whole situation and then provide the best answer for a problem. Uh, this solving idea that you were discussing before, and it has to do with this this concept that also came up uh, at, uh, during the discussion at the beginning about whether we have a purpose for the investiga investigation and the model that for us is the proposition, what we are, what we are looking at uh, and how we propose. And based on that are the ideas and the drivers of change we are building on. It's not, um, I think what the program uh, strengthens is not a forensic analysis, I would say, of, of all the factors involved, 
uh, but having um, having a point of view and uh, a way of looking at, at the city. And that's something that we discuss a lot and we build uh, within our, our own person. And I think that that was seen across, pro, uh, across the projects that we each have a personal um, standing point and point of view towards the city, but it's something that we discuss and we are strengthened. And from that, we look the city from a certain perspective. And that is what we, how we propose and how we understand and sort of analyze, but without being very, without uh, deluding ourselves in saying we're being very objective in analyzing the different conditions and providing an answer. That's how I'd say. We've got another question in the chat um, from Eduardo. Hi all, I'm sorry I can't make my question by video. I wanted to ask how the different programs interact between each other. Is there a tradition of formal knowledge exchange? How are you dealing with this issue in this virtual moment of time? And how are you planning to manage it in the future with a hybrid methodology? <laughs> That's a big lovely. question. <laughs> big question. And, and we're sorry for butting in and starting. I think um, other people can pick it up from kind of institutional side. Uh, there has been um, some, in, in that aspect of interchange, some gain uh, this year, um, despite all the difficulties. So we've got used to the idea that we don't, we can have many, many more guests in each program without flying people in. Uh, I know in MTech we've had, um, Elif will correct me if I'm wrong, but we've had almost a dozen people, uh, I think, given master classes. And I think in every program, uh, people have had much more, even though it's only online and virtual, much more interchange uh, outside. Inside, um, we hope we'll be back to um, the kind of a tradition where conversations in the bar, on the stairs, on the terraces are led by students who then buttonhole us at a member of staff in a different program. So there was a what we missed were the, all the informalities of uh, interchange. We have tried some more formal methods. Um, I think this is the first year we rolled out the, um, uh, a seminar course that was taught right across all programs with each program contributing one. So we're, we're not quite sure what the effect of that is. But we're very open to finding new ways of uh, interchange, to keeping the best of... Uh, what we discovered in long, online and, and mixing it with our kind of physical uh, presences. I, I think, Mike, you might want to add to that the, the new program of electives. Uh, this has been the first uh, year that we have really made a systematic approach to uh, uh, enabling students to study across the programs through the elective courses. Yes, um, we, some of those have been really successful and some a little more difficult to, to read uh, the purposes of them. But I think in terms of, I thought today was great and I'm much more, although I knew it more or less what every program was doing, it's actually really good to see different student takes on it. And whilst you can always read a program perspective, uh, prospectus, it's not the same thing as seeing a completed piece of work that's been done by an individual or a group. And I do think one of the lessons of today is we need more of this. Um, yeah, maybe just to contribute to Eduardo's question. I mean, each of the postgraduate programs is quite specialized. And I think in any way, they're quite ambitious in terms of each program constructing an environment specifically with that specialization in mind. But different projects actually kind of instigate, I think, different conversations across. And I think it's more like an open framework that you have access to people and that the tutors are generally quite open when students are basically asking questions or want to sit into a seminar. Juries are usually public, at least, you know, we try to make our juries public and so forth so that there is a kind of as-need thing. I think that we always uh, struggle within the AA 
between the formal and the informal. When we do things very formal, uh, I'll be very honest with you, it's quite terrible because somehow it superpositions, I think, a kind of conversation that is very free. And I think every faculty member here uh, feels some responsibility to students to engage in. So I think the, the seminars are things that have been much more open, and uh, those are kind of open from an institutional perspective. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that almost any faculty member would respond to any interest that students have, and usually that's very much project-based, which is where true collaboration comes. I think this kind of event has become quite rare, uh, but I think it's a sign that it should be much more about just speaking about work because work frames conversations. And I think the more that we do that, then it's less about the beginning and the end of something, but it's actually really about having this kind of constructed uh, stimulus and looking at the different kinds of ways that people are in interpreting and working on projects. If that's through the written word or if that's through design, if that's through simulation or strategy, like these are things that I think we can learn from. Um, because I think it, it has been missing in some degree, but that's not because of COVID. Uh, this is really about all of us coming together and really sharing our experiences. I think from that place, the AA as a community is quite unique in that. And uh, I think with the hybrid model and coming back to that, I think that emphasis is even going to be even more amplified uh, because of these kind of shared experiences that everybody has had. Or at least that's a desire from my point. It's a shared desire. That's what I wanted to say, Michael, but I didn't want to actually kind of express yeah. that. I, I think, uh, Edward, it's hard to give you an exact answer. And, and it's not because we're ducking the question. Um, as Theo said, we have this weird mixture at the A of, of the informal and and no, a few not very formal things. It's mainly informal. I can't tell you the number of times over 20 years when a student in MTech said to me, hey, my, my friend in DRL or in S doing this, can, can we have a go at that? Um, so the interaction of students is also and the interaction of tutors, but it is always what, what kind of drives um, exchanges between programs. We are doing more formal things, but we definitely, definitely do not want to lose um, the informal. And as a student, I don't know which program you're going to, but you know, the, the, AA, the point about the AA is you can walk into any studio. I mean, you have to be polite and, and say, hello, I'm so-and-so, and is it okay if I sit in on this session? But you, you can attend in any session on any workshop or seminar in any program. Actually, as a student, um, I, I want to yeah, like continue Michael's uh, story. We were helping our phase twos with uh, one MTech student, so it was actually quite a nice uh, experience working together. But um, in terms of today's event, um, I couldn't help but but thinking like, uh, yeah, what could be a collaboration between programs? I know it's probably not going to happen, but uh, still, I mean, some programs are like more visionary and kind of uh, operate on more, let's say, global scale. And some programs are very, I mean, yeah, like um, they, they go, let's say, really deep, right? And uh, I don't know, provide all of these amazing details. Well, obviously some of them are more expressive or theoretic and I mean, yeah, indeed they are quite specialized, but yeah, I don't know if it's possible to have a project uh, that I don't know, could combine somehow uh, like the strong parts of maybe not each program, but several programs. I don't know. That could be interesting, but well. <laughs> yeah, totally. But it also makes me think like for projects review, for example, right? You have to click three words that define your project and you can say that it's like digital infrastructural and technological or something. If that would be something for our students that we could do among the process, so we can see the bundle and pools of people who are working on the same thoughts. I think it will be uh, quite interesting. Rather yeah. than forcing it like through a, I don't know, curriculum thing um, into, yeah. into a project. the three words is going to do it, Darian. I remember Sorry. that. Do you think the three words is going to do it? I remember uh, that, <laughs> that um, 
uh, where you they I forget which company it is, but they 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 map the whole of the UK to every square meter it can be described in three words. So as a kind of mapping device. So there's a lot of potential combinations. I'm guessing of three words. Um, I don't know. It's hard to imagine some people restraining themselves to three. And there are some of us more technical ones who'd rather do three numbers than three words. Um, but maybe four. Well, I think uh, we should probably wrap here. Uh, I think all these points on the need for different levels and different kinds of conversation between programs are really good. I think more uh, on top of the informal stuff, I really appreciate uh, these more formal events. Uh, and especially I appreciate opportunities to really debate interesting differences uh, and interesting framings like the one we briefly had around the model. Uh, I'd really be interested to continue conversations like that somehow. And I don't, I don't know exactly what the the right uh, format for that would be, but I really hope that we have we get the chance uh, next year to do more similar events uh, at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, throughout the year. Um, Elena has to go. Um, I'll sign off uh, uh, for us both. I want to thank all the presenters for their incredible exemplary work. I want to thank all the program heads who are here to help introduce and help lead the discussion. And I especially want to thank Raj and Ben behind the scenes for putting this together. <laughs>